You wouldn't think him very appealing if you'd see him on his cantankerous days, believe me. But I'm glad you don't mind him it's all the nicer for Leslie. She'll have more to do when her boarder comes. I hope he'll be a decent creature. You'll probably like him he's a writer. I wonder why people so commonly suppose that if two individuals are both writers they must therefore be hugely congenial, said Anne, rather scornfully. Nobody would expect two blacksmiths to be violently attracted toward each other merely because they were both blacksmiths. Nevertheless, she looked forward to the advent of Owen Ford with a pleasant sense of expectation. If he were young and likable he might prove a very pleasant addition to society in Four Winds. The latch string of the little house was always out for the race of Joseph. Chapter 23. Owen Ford Comes. One evening Miss Cornelia telephoned down to Anne. The writer man has just arrived here. I'm going to drive him down to your place, and you can show him the way over to Leslie's. It's shorter than driving round by the other road, and I'm in a mortal hurry. The Reese baby has gone and fallen into a pail of hot water at the Glen, and got nearly scalded to death and they want me right off to put a new skin on the child, I presume. Mrs. Reese is always so careless and then expects other people to mend her mistakes. You won't mind, will you, dearie? His trunk can go down tomorrow. Very well, said Anne. What is he like, Miss Cornelia? You'll see what he's like outside when I take him down. As for what he's like inside only the Lord who made him knows that. I'm not going to say another word, for every receiver in the Glen is down. Miss Cornelia evidently can't find much fault with Mr. Ford's looks, or she would find it in spite of the receivers, said Anne. I conclude therefore, Susan, that Mr. Ford is rather handsome than otherwise. Well, Mrs. Doctor, dear, I do enjoy seeing a well-looking man, said Susan candidly. Had I not better get up a snack for him? There is a strawberry pie that would melt in your mouth. No. Leslie is expecting him and has his supper ready. Besides, I want that strawberry pie for my own poor man. He won't be home till late, so leave the pie and a glass of milk out for him, Susan. That I will, Mrs. Doctor, dear. Susan is at the helm. After all, it is better to give pie to your own men than to strangers, who may be only seeking to devour, and the doctor himself is as well-looking a man as you often come across. When Owen Ford came and secretly admitted, as Miss Cornelia towed him in, that he was very, well-looking, indeed. He was tall and broad-shouldered, with thick, brown hair, finely cut nose and chin, large and brilliant dark gray eyes. And did you notice his ears and his teeth, Mrs. Doctor, dear? Queried Susan later on. He has got the nicest shaped ears I ever saw on a man's head. I am choice about ears. When I was young I was scared that I might have to marry a man with ears like flaps. But I need not have worried, for never a chance did I have with any kind of ears. Anne had not noticed Owen Ford's ears, but she did see his teeth, as his lips parted over them in a frank and friendly smile. Unsmiling, his face was rather sad and absent in expression, not unlike the melancholy, inscrutable hero of Anne's own early dreams but mirth and humor and charm lighted it up when he smiled. Certainly, on the outside, as Miss Cornelia said, Owen Ford was a very presentable fellow. You cannot realize how delighted I am to be here, Mrs. Bleeth, he said, looking around him with eager, interested eyes. I have an odd feeling of coming home. My mother was born and spent her childhood here, you know. She used to talk a great deal to me of her old home. I know the geography of it as well as of the one I lived in, and, of course, she told me the story of the building of the house, and of my grandfather's agonized watch for the Royal William. I had thought that so old a house must have vanished years ago, or I should have come to see it before this. Old houses don't vanish easily on this enchanted coast, smiled Anne. This is a, land where all things always seem the same, nearly always, at least. John Selwyn's house hasn't even been much changed, and outside the rose bushes your grandfather planted for his bride are blooming this very minute. How the thought links me with them. With your leave I must explore the whole place soon.
Our latch string will always be out for you, promised Anne. And do you know that the old sea captain who keeps the four winds light knew John Selwyn and his bride well in his boyhood? He told me their story the night I came here the third bride of the old house. Can it be possible? This is a discovery. I must hunt him up. It won't be difficult. We are all cronies of Captain Jim. He will be as eager to see you as you could be to see him. Your grandmother shines like a star in his memory. But I think Mrs. Moore is expecting you. I'll show you our cross lots road. Anne walked with him to the house up the brook, over a field that was as white as snow with daisies. A boatload of people were singing far across the harbor. The sound drifted over the water like faint, unearthly music wind blown across a starlit sea. The big light flashed and beaconed. Owen Ford looked around him with satisfaction. And so this is four winds, he said. I wasn't prepared to find it quite so beautiful, in spite of all mother's praises. What colors what scenery what charm. I shall get as strong as a horse in no time. And if inspiration comes from beauty, I should certainly be able to begin my great Canadian novel here. You haven't begun it yet? Asked Anne. Alack a day, no. I've never been able to get the right central idea for it. It lurks beyond me it allures and beckons and recedes I almost grasp it and it is gone. Perhaps amid this peace and loveliness, I shall be able to capture it. Miss Bryant tells me that you write. Oh, I do little things for children. I haven't done much since I was married. And I have no designs on a great Canadian novel, laughed Anne. That is quite beyond me. Owen Ford laughed too. I dare say it is beyond me as well. All the same I mean to have a try at it some day, if I can ever get time. A newspaper man doesn't have much chance for that sort of thing. I've done a good deal of short story writing for the magazines, but I've never had the leisure that seems to be necessary for the writing of a book. With three months of liberty I ought to make a start, though if I could only get the necessary motif for it the soul of the book. An idea whisked through Anne's brain with a suddenness that made her jump. But she did not utter it, for they had reached the Moore house. As they entered the yard Leslie came out on the veranda from the side door, peering through the gloom for some sign of her expected guest. She stood just where the warm yellow light flooded her from the open door. She wore a plain dress of cheap, cream-tinted cotton boil, with the usual girdle of crimson. Leslie was never without her touch of crimson. She had told Anne that she never felt satisfied without a gleam of red somewhere about her, if it were only a flower. To Anne, it always seemed to symbolize Leslie's glowing, pent-up personality, denied all expression save in that flaming glint. Leslie's dress was cut a little away at the neck and had short sleeves. Her arms gleamed like ivory-tinted marble. Every exquisite curve of her form was outlined in soft darkness against the light. Her hair shone in it like flame. Beyond her was a purple sky, flowering with stars over the harbor. Anne heard her companion give a gasp. Even in the dusk she could see the amazement and admiration on his face. Who is that beautiful creature? He asked. That is Mrs. Moore, said Anne. She is very lovely, isn't she? I, I never saw anything like her, he answered, rather dazedly. I wasn't prepared I didn't expect good heavens, one doesn't expect a goddess for a landlady. Why, if she were clothed in a gown of sea purple, with a rope of amethysts in her hair, she would be a veritable sea queen. And she takes in boarders. Even goddesses must live, said Anne. And Leslie isn't a goddess. She's just a very beautiful woman, as human as the rest of us. Did Miss Bryant tell you about Mr. Moore? Yes. He's mentally deficient, or something of the sort, isn't he? But she said nothing about Mrs. Moore, and I supposed she'd be the usual hustling country housewife who takes in boarders to earn an honest penny. Well, that's just what Leslie is doing, said Anne crisply. And it isn't altogether pleasant for her, either. I hope you won't mind Dick. If you do, please don't let Leslie see it. It would hurt her horribly. He's just a big baby, and sometimes a rather annoying one. Oh, I won't mind him. I don't suppose I'll be much in the house anyhow, 
except for meals. But what a shame it all is. Her life must be a hard one. It is. But she doesn't like to be pitied. Leslie had gone back into the house and now met them at the front door. She greeted Owen Ford with cold civility, and told him in a business-like tone that his room and his supper were ready for him. Dick, with a pleased grin, shambled upstairs with the valise, and Owen Ford was installed as an inmate of the old house among the willows. Chapter 24 The Life Book of Captain Jim I have a little brown cocoon of an idea that may possibly expand into a magnificent moth of fulfillment, Anne told Gilbert when she reached home. He had returned earlier than she had expected, and was enjoying Susan's cherry pie. Susan herself hovered in the background, like a rather grim but beneficent guardian spirit, and found as much pleasure in watching Gilbert eat pie as he did in eating it. What is your idea? he asked. I shan't tell you just yet not till I see if I can bring the thing about. What sort of a chap is Ford? Oh, very nice, and quite good looking. Such beautiful ears, doctor, dear, interjected Susan with a relish. He is about 30 or 35, I think, and he meditates writing a novel. His voice is pleasant and his smile delightful, and he knows how to dress. He looks as if life hadn't been altogether easy for him, somehow. Owen Ford came over the next evening with a note to Anne from Leslie. They spent the sunset time in the garden and then went for a moonlit sail on the harbor, in the little boat Gilbert had set up for summer outings. They liked Owen immensely and had that feeling of having known him for many years which distinguishes the Freemasonry of the House of Joseph. He is as nice as his ears, Mrs. Doctor, dear said Susan, when he had gone. He had told Susan that he had never tasted anything like her strawberry shortcake and Susan's susceptible heart was his forever. He has got a way with him, she reflected, as she cleared up the relics of the supper. It is real queer he is not married, for a man like that could have anybody for the asking. Well, maybe he is like me, and has not met the right one yet. Susan really grew quite romantic in her musings as she washed the supper dishes. Two nights later Anne took Owen Ford down to Four Winds Point to introduce him to Captain Jim. The clover fields along the harbor shore were whitening in the western wind, and Captain Jim had one of his finest sunsets on exhibition. He himself had just returned from a trip over the harbor. I had to go over and tell Henry Pollock he was dying. Everybody else was afraid to tell him. They expected he'd take on Turrible, for he's been dreadful determined to live, and been making no end of plans for the fall. His wife thought he outer be told and that I'd be the best one to break it to him that he couldn't get better. Henry and me are old cronies we sailed in the Grey Gull for years together. Well, I went over and sat down by Henry's bed and I says to him, says I, just write out plain and simple, for if a thing's got to be told it may as well be told first as last says I, mate, I reckon you've got your sailing orders this time, I was sorter quaking inside, for it's an awful thing to have to tell a man who hain't any idea he's dying that he is. But lo and behold, Mistress Blythe, Henry looks up at me, with those bright old black eyes of his in his wizened face and says, says he, tell me something I don't know, Jim Boyd, if you want to give me information. I've known that for a week. I was too astonished to speak and Henry, he chuckled. To see you coming in here, says he, with your face as solemn as a tombstone and sitting down there with your hands clasped over your stomach, and passing me out a blue moldy old item of news like that. It'd make a cat laugh, Jim Boyd, says he. Who told you, says I, stupid like. Nobody, says he. A week ago Tuesday night I was lying here awake and I just knew. I'd suspicioned it before but then I knew. I've been keeping up for the wife's sake. And I'd like to have got that barn built, for Evan'll never get it right. But anyhow, now that you've eased your mind, Jim, put on a smile and tell me something interesting, well, there it was. They'd been so scared to tell him and he knew it all the time. Strange how nature looks out for us, ain't it, and lets us know what we should know when the time comes. Did I never tell you the yarn about Henry getting the fish hook in his nose, Mistress Blythe? No. Well, 
Him and me had a laugh over it today. It happened nigh unto thirty years ago. Him and me and several more was out mackerel fishing one day. It was a great day never saw such a school of mackerel in the gulf and in the general excitement Henry got quite wild and contrived to stick a fish hook clean through one side of his nose. Well, there he was. There was barb on one end and a big piece of lead on the other, so it couldn't be pulled out. We wanted to take him ashore at once, but Henry was game. He said he'd be jiggered if he'd leave a school like that for anything short of lockjaw. Then he kept fishing away, hauling in hand over fist and groaning between times. Finally the school passed and we come in with a load. I got a file and begun to try to file through that hook. I tried to be as easy as I could, but you should have heard Henry know, you shouldn't either. It was well no ladies were around. Henry wasn't a swearing man. But he'd heard some few matters of that sort along shore in his time, and he fished them all out of his recollection and hurled them at me. Finally he declared he couldn't stand it and I had no bowels of compassion. So we hitched up and I drove him to a doctor in Charlottetown, 35 miles there weren't none nearer in them days with that blessed hook still hanging from his nose. When we got there old Dr. Crab Jest took a file and filed that hook just the same as I'd tried to do. Only he weren't a mite particular about doing it easy. Captain Jim's visit to his old friend had revived many recollections and he was now in the full tide of reminiscences. Henry was asking me today if I remember the time old Father Chiniki blessed Alexander Macklister's boat. Another odd yarn and true as gospel. I was in the boat myself. We went out, him and me, in Alexander Macklister's boat one morning at sunrise. Besides, there was a French boy in the boat Catholic of course. You know old Father Chiniki had turned Protestant, so the Catholics hadn't much use for him. Well, we sat out in the gulf in the broiling sun till noon, and not a bite did we get. When we went ashore old Father Chiniki had to go, so he said in that polite way of his, I'm very sorry I cannot go out with you this afternoon, Mr. McClister, but I leave you my blessing. You will catch a Tucson this afternoon. Well, we did not catch a thousand, but we caught exactly 999 the biggest catch for a small boat on the whole North Shore that summer. Curious, wasn't it? Alexander McAllister. He says to Andrew Peters, Well, and what do you think of Father Chiniki now? Well, growled Andrew, I think the old devil has got a blessing left yet. Laws, how Henry did laugh over that today. Do you know who Mr. Ford is, Captain Jim? Asked Anne, seeing that Captain Jim's fountain of reminiscence had run out for the present. I want you to guess. Captain Jim shook his head. I never was any hand at guessing, Mistress Blythe, and yet somehow when I come in I thought, where have I seen them eyes before, for I have seen them. Think of a September morning many years ago, said Anne, softly. Think of a ship sailing up the harbor a ship long waited for and despaired of. Think of the day the Royal William came in and the first look you had at the Shulmaster's bride. Captain Jim sprang up. There Persis Selwyn's eyes. He almost shouted. You can't be her son you must be her. Grandson, yes, I am Alice Selwyn's son. Captain Jim swooped down on Owen Ford and shook his hand over again. Alice Selwyn's son. Lord but you're welcome. Many's the time I've wondered where the descendants of the schoolmaster were living. I knew there was none on the island. Alice Alice the first baby ever born in that little house. No baby ever brought more joy. I've dandled her a hundred times. It was from my knee she took her first steps alone. Can't I see her mother's face watching her and it was near sixty years ago. Is she living yet? No, she died when I was only a boy. Oh. It doesn't seem right that I should be living to hear that, sighed Captain Jim. But I'm heart glad to see you. It's brought back my youth for a little while. You don't know yet what a boon that is. Mistress Blythe here has the trick she does it quite often for me. Captain Jim was still more excited when he discovered that Owen Ford was what he called a real writing man. He gazed at him as at a superior being. Captain Jim knew that Anne wrote but he had never taken that fact very seriously. Captain Jim thought women were delightful creatures, who ought to have the vote, and everything else they wanted, 
bless their hearts, but he did not believe they could write. Just look at a mad love, he would protest. A woman wrote that and just look at it 103 chapters when it could all have been told in 10. A writing woman never knows when to stop, that's the trouble. The peant of good writing is to know when to stop. Mr. Bird wants to hear some of your stories, Captain Jim, said Anne. Tell him the one about the captain who went crazy and imagined he was the Flying Dutchman. This was Captain Jim's best story. It was a compound of horror and humor, and though Anne had heard it several times she laughed as heartily and shivered as fearsomely over it as Mr. Ford did. Other tales followed, for Captain Jim had an audience after his own heart. He told how his vessel had been run down by a steamer, how he had been boarded by Malay pirates, how his ship had caught fire, how he helped a political prisoner escape from a South African republic, how he had been wrecked one fall on the Magdalens and stranded there for the winter, how a tiger had broken loose on board ship, how his crew had mutinied and marooned him on a barren island. These and many other tales, tragic or humorous or grotesque, did Captain Jim relate. The mystery of the sea, the fascination of far lands, the lure of adventure, the laughter of the world his hearers felt and realized them all. Owen Ford listened, with his head on his hand, and the first mate purring on his knee, his brilliant eyes fastened on Captain Jim's rugged, eloquent face. Won't you let Mr. Ford see your life book, Captain Jim? asked Anne, when Captain Jim finally declared that yarn spinning must end for the time. Oh, he don't want to be bothered with that, protested Captain Jim who was secretly dying to show it. I should like nothing better than to see it, Captain Boyd, said Owen. If it is half as wonderful as your tales it will be worth seeing. With pretended reluctance Captain Jim dug his life book out of his old chest and handed it to Owen. I reckon you won't care to wrestle long with my old hand oh right. I never had much schooling, he observed carelessly. Just wrote that there to amuse my nephew Joe. He's always wanting stories. Comes here yesterday and says to me, reproachful like, as I was lifting a 20 pound codfish out of my boat, Uncle Jim, ain't a codfish a dumb animal. I'd been a telling him, you see, that he must be real kind to dumb animals, and never hurt him in any way. I got out of the scrape by saying a codfish was dumb enough, but it wasn't an animal, but Joe didn't look satisfied, and I wasn't satisfied myself. You've got to be mighty careful what you tell them little critters. They can see through you. While talking, Captain Jim watched Owen Ford from the corner of his eye as the latter examined the life book, and presently observing that his guest was lost in its pages, he turned smilingly to his cupboard and proceeded to make a pot of tea. Owen Ford separated himself from the life book, with as much reluctance as a miser wrenches himself from his gold, long enough to drink his tea, and then return to it hungrily. Oh, you can take that thing home with you if you want to, said Captain Jim, as if the thing were not his most treasured possession. I must go down and pull my boat up a bit on the skids. There's a wind coming. Did you notice the sky tonight? Mackerel skies and mares tails make tall ships carry short sails. Owen Ford accepted the offer of the life book gladly. On their way home Anne told him the story of lost Margaret. That old captain is a wonderful old fellow, he said. What a life he has led. Why, the man had more adventures in one week of his life than most of us have in a lifetime. Do you really think his tales are all true? I certainly do. I am sure Captain Jim could not tell a lie. And besides, all the people about here say that everything happened as he relates it. There used to be plenty of his old shipmates alive to corroborate him. He's one of the last of the old type of P.E. Island Sea Captains. They are almost extinct now. Chapter 25. The Writing of the Book. Owen Ford came over to the little house the next morning in a state of great excitement. Mrs. Bleeth, this is a wonderful book absolutely wonderful. If I could take it and use the material for a book I feel certain I could make the novel of the year out of it. Do you suppose Captain Jim would let me do it? Let you? I'm sure he would be delighted, cried Anne. I admit that it was what was in my head when I took you down last night. 
Captain Jim has always been wishing he could get somebody to write his life book properly for him. Will you go down to the point with me this evening, Mrs. Bleed? I'll ask him about that life book myself, but I want you to tell him that you told me the story of Lost Margaret and ask him if he will let me use it as a thread of romance with which to weave the stories of the life book into a harmonious whole. Captain Jim was more excited than ever when Owen Ford told him of his plan. At last his cherished dream was to be realized and his life book given to the world. He was also pleased that the story of Lost Margaret should be woven into it. It will keep her name from being forgotten, he said wistfully. That's why I want it put in. We'll collaborate, cried Owen delightedly. You will give the soul and I the body. Oh, we'll write a famous book between us, Captain Jim. And we'll get right to work. And to think my book is to be writ by the Schulmaster's grandson. Exclaimed Captain Jim. Lad, your grandfather was my dearest friend. I thought there was nobody like him. I see now why I had to wait so long. It couldn't be writ till the right man come. You belong here you've got the soul of this old North Shore in you you're the only one who could write it. It was arranged that the tiny room off the living room at the lighthouse should be given over to Owen for a workshop. It was necessary that Captain Jim should be near him as he wrote, for consultation upon many matters of seafaring and gulf lore of which Owen was quite ignorant. He began work on the book the very next morning, and flung himself into it heart and soul. As for Captain Jim, he was a happy man that summer. He looked upon the little room where Owen worked as a sacred shrine. Owen talked everything over with Captain Jim, but he would not let him see the manuscript. You must wait until it is published, he said. Then you'll get it all at once in its best shape. He delved into the treasures of the life book and used them freely. He dreamed and brooded over lost Margaret until she became a vivid reality to him and lived in his pages. As the book progressed it took possession of him and he worked at it with feverish eagerness. He let Anne and Leslie read the manuscript and criticize it, and the concluding chapter of the book, which the critics, later on, were pleased to call idyllic, was modeled upon a suggestion of Leslie's. Anne fairly hugged herself with delight over the success of her idea. I knew when I looked at Owen Ford that he was the very man for it, she told Gilbert. Both humor and passion were in his face, and that, together with the art of expression, was just what was necessary for the writing of such a book. As Mrs. Rachel would say, he was predestined for the part. Owen Ford wrote in the mornings. The afternoons were generally spent in some merry outing with the Blitz. Leslie often went, too, for Captain Jim took charge of Dick frequently, in order to set her free. They went boating on the harbor and up the three pretty rivers that flowed into it. They had clam bakes on the bar and mussel bakes on the rocks. They picked strawberries on the sand dunes. They went out cod fishing with Captain Jim. They shot plover in the shore fields and wild ducks in the cove at least, the men did. In the evenings they rambled in the low-lying, daisied, Shore fields under a golden moon, or they sat in the living room at the little house where often the coolness of the sea breeze justified a driftwood fire, and talked of the thousand and one things which happy, eager, clever young people can find to talk about. Ever since the day on which she had made her confession to Anne Leslie had been a changed creature. There was no trace of her old coldness and reserve, no shadow of her old bitterness. The girlhood of which she had been cheated seemed to come back to her with the ripeness of womanhood. She expanded like a flower of flame and perfume. No laugh was readier than hers, no wit quicker, in the twilight circles of that enchanted summer. When she could not be with them all felt that some exquisite savor was lacking in their intercourse. Her beauty was illumined by the awakened soul within, as some rosy lamp might shine through a flawless vase of alabaster. There were hours when Anne's eyes seemed to ache with the splendor of her. As for Owen Ford, the, Margaret, of his book, although she had the soft brown hair and elfin face of the real girl who had vanished so long ago, pillowed where lost Atlantis sleeps, had the personality of Leslie Moore, as it was revealed to him in those halcyon days at Four Winds Harbor. All in all, it was a never-to-be-forgotten summer one of those summers which come seldom into any life 
but leave a rich heritage of beautiful memories in their going one of those summers which, in a fortunate combination of delightful weather, delightful friends and delightful doings, come as near to perfection as anything can come in this world. Too good to last, Anne told herself with a little sigh. On the September day when a certain nip in the wind and a certain shade of intense blue on the gulf water said that autumn was hard by. That evening Owen Ford told them that he had finished his book and that his vacation must come to an end. I have a good deal to do to it yet revising and pruning and so forth, he said, but in the main it's done. I wrote the last sentence this morning. If I can find a publisher for it it will probably be out next summer or fall. Owen had not much doubt that he would find a publisher. He knew that he had written a great book a book that would score a wonderful success a book that would live. He knew that it would bring him both fame and fortune, but when he had written the last line of it he had bowed his head on the manuscript and so sat for a long time. And his thoughts were not of the good work he had done. Chapter 26 Owen Ford's Confession I'm so sorry Gilbert is away, said Anne. He had to go Alan Lyons at the Glen has met with a serious accident. He will not likely be home till very late. But he told me to tell you he'd be up and over early enough in the morning to see you before you left. It's too provoking. Susan and I had planned such a nice little jamboree for your last night here. She was sitting beside the garden brook on the little rustic seat Gilbert had built. Owen Ford stood before her leaning against the bronze column of a yellow birch. He was very pale and his face bore the marks of the preceding sleepless night. Anne, glancing up at him, wondered if, after all, his summer had brought him the strength it should. Had he worked too hard over his book? She remembered that for a week he had not been looking well. I'm rather glad the doctor is away, said Owen slowly. I wanted to see you alone, Mrs. Bleed. There is something I must tell somebody, or I think it will drive me mad. I've been trying for a week to look it in the face and I can't. I know I can trust you and, besides, you will understand. A woman with eyes like yours always understands. You are one of the folks people instinctively tell things to. Mrs. Bleed, I love Leslie. Love her. That seems too weak a word. His voice suddenly broke with the suppressed passion of his utterance. He turned his head away and hid his face on his arm. His whole form shook. Anne sat looking at him, pale and aghast. She had never thought of this. And yet how was it she had never thought of it? It now seemed a natural and inevitable thing. She wondered at her own blindness. But but things like this did not happen in four winds. Elsewhere in the world human passions might set at defiance human conventions and laws but not here, surely. Leslie had kept summer boarders off and on for ten years, and nothing like this had happened. But perhaps they had not been like Owen Ford, and the vivid, living Leslie of this summer was not the cold, sullen girl of other years. Oh, somebody should have thought of this. Why hadn't Miss Cornelia thought of it? Miss Cornelia was always ready enough to sound the alarm where men were concerned. Anne felt an unreasonable resentment against Miss Cornelia. Then she gave a little inward groan. No matter who was to blame the mischief was done. And Leslie what of Leslie? It was for Leslie Anne felt most concerned. Does Leslie know this, Mr. Furt? She asked quietly. No no, unless she has guessed it. You surely don't think I'd be cad and scoundrel enough to tell her, Mrs. Bleed. I couldn't help loving her that's all and my misery is greater than I can bear. Does she care? Asked Anne. The moment the question crossed her lips she felt that she should not have asked it. Owen Ford answered it with overeager protest. No no, of course not. But I could make her care if she were free I know I could. She does care and he knows it, thought Anne. Aloud she said, sympathetically but decidedly. But she is not free, Mr. Ford. And the only thing you can do is to go away in silence and leave her to her own life. I know I know groaned Owen. He sat down on the grassy bank and stared moodily into the amber water beneath him. I know there's nothing to do nothing but to say conventionally, goodbye, Mrs. Moore. Thank you for all your kindness to me this summer, just as I would have said it to the Sinzi, bustling, 
keen-eyed housewife I expected her to be when I came. Then I'll pay my board money like any honest boarder and go. Oh, it's very simple. No doubt no perplexity a straight road to the end of the world. And I'll walk it you needn't fear that I won't, Mrs. Bleed. But it would be easier to walk over red-hot plowshares. Anne flinched with the pain of his voice. And there was so little she could say that would be adequate to the situation. Blame was out of the question advice was not needed sympathy was mocked by the man's stark agony. She could only feel with him in a maze of compassion and regret. Her heart ached for Leslie. Had not that poor girl suffered enough without this. It wouldn't be so hard to go and leave her if she were only happy, resumed Owen passionately. But to think of her living death to realize what it is to which I do leave her. That is the worst of all. I would give my life to make her happy and I can do nothing even to help her nothing. She is bound forever to that poor wretch with nothing to look forward to but growing old in a succession of empty, meaningless, barren years. It drives me mad to think of it. But I must go through my life, never seeing her, but always knowing what she is enduring. It's hideous hideous. It is very hard, said Anne sorrowfully. We her friends here all know how hard it is for her. And she is so richly fitted for life, said Owen rebelliously. Her beauty is the least of her dower and she is the most beautiful woman I've ever known. That laugh of hers. I've angled all summer to evoke that laugh, just for the delight of hearing it. And her eyes they are as deep and blue as the gulf out there. I never saw such blueness and gold. Did you ever see her hair down, Mrs. Bleed? No, I did once. I had gone down to the point to go fishing with Captain Jim but it was too rough to go out, so I came back. She had taken the opportunity of what she expected to be an afternoon alone to wash her hair, and she was standing on the veranda in the sunshine to dry it. It fell all about her to her feet in a fountain of living gold. When she saw me she hurried in, and the wind caught her hair and swirled it all around her Danae in her cloud. Somehow, just then the knowledge that I loved her came home to me and realized that I had loved her from the moment I first saw her standing against the darkness in that glow of light. And she must live on here petting and soothing Dick, pinching and saving for a mere existence, while I spend my life longing vainly for her, and debarred, by that very fact, from even giving her the little help a friend might. I walked the shore last night, almost till dawn, and thrashed it all out over and over again. And yet, in spite of everything, I can't find it in my heart to be sorry that I came to Four Winds. It seems to me that, bad as everything is, it would be still worse never to have known Leslie. It's burning, searing pain to love her and leave her but not to have loved her is unthinkable. I suppose all this sounds very crazy all these terrible emotions always do sound foolish when we put them into our inadequate words. They are not meant to be spoken only felt and endured. I shouldn't have spoken but it has helped some. At least, it has given me strength to go away respectably tomorrow morning without making a scene. You'll write me now and then, won't you, Mrs. Bleed, and give me what news there is to give of her? Yes, said Anne. Oh, I'm so sorry you are going we'll miss you so we've all been such friends. If it were not for this you could come back other summers. Perhaps, even yet by and by when you've forgotten, perhaps. I shall never forget and I shall never come back to Four Winds, said Owen briefly. Silence and twilight fell over the garden. Far away the sea was lapping gently and monotonously on the bar. The wind of evening in the poplars sounded like some sad, weird, old rune some broken dream of old memories. A slender shapely young aspen rose up before them against the fine maize and emerald and paling rose of the western sky, which brought out every leaf and twig in dark, tremulous, elfin loveliness. Isn't that beautiful? said Owen pointing to it with the air of a man who puts a certain conversation behind him. It's so beautiful that it hurts me, said Anne softly. Perfect things like that always did hurt me I remember I called it, the queer ache, when I was a child. What is the reason that pain like this seems inseparable from perfection? Is it the pain of finality when we realize that there can be nothing beyond but retrogression? Perhaps, said Owen dreamily, 
It is the prisoned infinite in us calling out to its kindred infinite as expressed in that visible perfection. You seem to have a cold in the head. Better rub some tallow on your nose when you go to bed, said Miss Cornelia, who had come in through the little gate between the firs in time to catch Owen's last remark. Miss Cornelia liked Owen, but it was a matter of principle with her to visit any highfalutin language from a man with a snub. Miss Cornelia personated the comedy that ever peeps around the corner at the tragedy of life. Anne, whose nerves had been rather strained, laughed hysterically, and even Owen smiled. Certainly, sentiment and passion had a way of shrinking out of sight in Miss Cornelia's presence. And yet to Anne nothing seemed quite as hopeless and dark and painful as it had seemed a few moments before. But sleep was far from her eyes that night. Chapter 27 on the sand bar. Owen Ford left Four Winds the next morning. In the evening Anne went over to see Leslie, but found nobody. The house was locked and there was no light in any window. It looked like a home left soulless. Leslie did not run over on the following day which Anne thought a bad sign. Gilbert having occasion to go in the evening to the fishing cove, Anne drove with him to the point, intending to stay a while with Captain Jim. But the great light, cutting its swaths through the fog of the autumn evening, was in care of Alec Boyd and Captain Jim was away. What will you do? asked Gilbert. Come with me. I don't want to go to the cove but I'll go over the channel with you, and roam about on the sand shore till you come back. The rock shore is too slippery and grim tonight. Alone on the sands of the bar Anne gave herself up to the eerie charm of the night. It was warm for September, and the late afternoon had been very foggy but a full moon had in part lessened the fog and transformed the harbor and the gulf and the surrounding shores into a strange, fantastic, unreal world of pale silver mist, through which everything loomed phantom-like. Captain Josiah Crawford's black schooner sailing down the channel, laden with potatoes for blue-nose ports, was a spectral ship bound for a far uncharted land, ever receding, never to be reached. The calls of unseen gulls overhead were the cries of the souls of doomed seamen. The little curls of foam that blew across the sand were elfin things stealing up from the sea caves. The big, round-shouldered sand dunes were the sleeping giants of some old northern tale. The lights that glimmered palely across the harbor were the delusive beacons on some coast of fairyland. Anne pleased herself with a hundred fancies as she wandered through the mist. It was delightful romantic mysterious to be roaming here alone on this enchanted shore. But was she alone? Something loomed in the mist before her took shape and form suddenly moved towards her across the wave-rippled sand. Leslie! exclaimed Anne in amazement. Whatever are you doing here tonight? If it comes to that, whatever are you doing here? said Leslie, trying to laugh. The effort was a failure. She looked very pale and tired but the love locks under her scarlet cap were curling about her face and eyes like little sparkling rings of gold. I'm waiting for Gilbert he's over at the cove. I intended to stay at the light, but Captain Jim is away. Well, underscore I underscore came here because I wanted to walk and walk and walk, said Leslie restlessly. I couldn't on the rock shore the tide was too high and the rocks prisoned me. I had to come here or I should have gone mad, I think. I rowed myself over the channel in Captain Jim's flat. I've been here for an hour. Come come let us walk. I can't stand still. Oh, Anne. Leslie, dearest, what is the trouble? Asked Anne, though she knew too well already. I can't tell you don't ask me. I wouldn't mind your knowing I wish you did know but I can't tell you I can't tell anyone. I've been such a fool, Anne and oh, it hurts so terribly to be a fool. There's nothing so painful in the world. She laughed bitterly. Anne slipped her arm around her. Leslie, is it that you have learned to care for Misterford? Leslie turned herself about passionately. How did you know? She cried. Anne, how did you know? Oh, is it written in my face for everyone to see? Is it as plain as that? No, no, I, I can't tell you how I knew. It just came into my mind, somehow. Leslie, don't look at me like that. Do you despise me? Demanded Leslie in a fierce, low tone. Do you think I'm wicked unwomanly? Or do you think I'm just plain fool? 
I don't think you any of those things. Come, dear, let's just talk it over sensibly, as we might talk over any other of the great crises of life. You've been brooding over it and let yourself drift into a morbid view of it. You know you have a little tendency to do that about everything that goes wrong, and you promised me that you would fight against it. But oh, it's so so shameful, murmured Leslie. To love him unsought and when I'm not free to love anybody. There's nothing shameful about it. But I'm very sorry that you have learned to care for Owen, because, as things are, it will only make you more unhappy. I didn't learn to care, said Leslie, walking on and speaking passionately. If it had been like that I could have prevented it. I never dreamed of such a thing until that day, a week ago, when he told me he had finished his book and must soon go away. Then then I knew. I felt as if someone had struck me a terrible blow. I didn't say anything I couldn't speak but I don't know what I looked like. I'm so afraid my face betrayed me. Oh, I would die of shame if I thought he knew or suspected. Anne was miserably silent hampered by her deductions from her conversation with Owen. Leslie went on feverishly, as if she found relief in speech. I was so happy all this summer, and happier than I ever was in my life. I thought it was because everything had been made clear between you and me, and that it was our friendship which made life seem so beautiful and full once more. And it was, in part but not all oh, not nearly all. I know now why everything was so different. And now it's all over and he has gone. How can I live, Anne? When I turned back into the house this morning after he had gone the solitude struck me like a blow in the face. It won't seem so hard by and by, dear, said Anne, who always felt the pain of her friends so keenly that she could not speak easy, fluent words of comforting. Besides, she remembered how well-meant speeches had hurt her in her own sorrow and was afraid. Oh. It seems to me it will grow harder all the time, said Leslie miserably. I've nothing to look forward to. Morning will come after morning and he will not come back he will never come back. Oh, when I think that I will never see him again I feel as if a great brutal hand had twisted itself among my heartstrings, and was wrenching them. Once, long ago, I dreamed of love and I thought it must be beautiful and now it's like this. When he went away yesterday morning he was so cold and indifferent. He said, Goodbye, Mrs. Moore, in the coldest tone in the world as if we had not even been friends as if I meant absolutely nothing to him. I know I don't I didn't want him to care but he might have been a little kinder. Oh, I wish Gilbert would come, thought Anne. She was racked between her sympathy for Leslie and the necessity of avoiding anything that would betray Owen's confidence. She knew why his goodbye had been so cold why it could not have the cordiality that their good comradeship demanded but she could not tell Leslie. I couldn't help it, and I couldn't help it, said poor Leslie. I know that. Do you blame me so very much? I don't blame you at all. And you won't you won't tell Gilbert. Leslie, do you think I would do such a thing? Oh, I don't know you and Gilbert are such chums. I don't see how you could help telling him everything. Everything about my own concerns yes. But not my friend's secrets. I couldn't have him know. But I'm glad you know. I would feel guilty if there were anything I was ashamed to tell you. I hope Miss Cornelia won't find out. Sometimes I feel as if those terrible, kind brown eyes of hers read my very soul. Oh, I wish this mist would never lift I wish I could just stay in it forever hidden away from every living being. I don't see how I can go on with life. This summer has been so full. I never was lonely for a moment. Before Owen came there used to be horrible moments when I had been with you and Gilbert and then had to leave you. You two would walk away together and I would walk away alone. After Owen came he was always there to walk home with me we would laugh and talk as you and Gilbert were doing there were no more lonely, envious moments for me. And now, oh, yes, I've been a fool. Let's have done talking about my folly. I'll never bore you with it again. Here is Gilbert, and you are coming back with us, said Anne, who had no intention of leaving Leslie to wander alone on the sandbar on such a night and in such a mood. There's plenty of room in our boat for three, and we'll tie the flat on behind. Oh, 
I suppose I must reconcile myself to being the odd one again, said poor Leslie with another bitter laugh. Forgive me, Anne that was hateful. I ought to be thankful and I am that I have two good friends who are glad to count me in as a third. Don't mind my hateful speeches. I just seem to be one great pain all over and everything hurts me. Leslie seemed very quiet tonight, didn't she? Said Gilbert, when he and Anne reached home. What in the world was she doing over there on the bar alone? Oh, she was tired and you know she likes to go to the shore after one of Dick's bad days. What a pity she hadn't met and married a fellow like Ford long ago, ruminated Gilbert. They'd have made an ideal couple, wouldn't they? For pity's sake, Gilbert, don't develop into a matchmaker. It's an abominable profession for a man, cried Anne rather sharply, afraid that Gilbert might blunder on the truth if he kept on in this strain. Bless us, Anne girl, I'm not matchmaking, protested Gilbert, rather surprised at her tone. I was only thinking of one of the might-have-beens. Well, don't. It's a waste of time, said Anne. Then she added suddenly, Oh, Gilbert, I wish everybody could be as happy as we are. Chapter 28 Odds and Ends I've been reading obituary notices, said Miss Cornelia, laying down the daily enterprise and taking up her sewing. The harbor was lying black and sullen under a dour November sky. The wet, dead leaves clung drenched and sodden to the window sills, but the little house was gay with firelight and spring-like with Anne's ferns and geraniums. It's always summer here, Anne, Leslie had said one day, and all who were the guests of that house of dreams felt the same. The enterprise seems to run to obituaries these days, quoth Miss Cornelia. It always has a couple of columns of them, and I read every line. It's one of my forms of recreation, especially when there's some original poetry attached to them. Here's a choice sample for you. She's gone to be with her maker, never more to roam. She used to play and sing with joy the song of home, sweet home. Who says we haven't any poetical talent on the island? Have you ever noticed what heaps of good people die, Anne, dearie? It's kind of pitiful. Here's ten obituaries, and every one of them saints and models, even the men. Here's old Peter Stimson, who has, left a large circle of friends to mourn his untimely loss. Lord, Anne, dearie, that man was eighty, and everybody who knew him had been wishing him dead these thirty years. Read obituaries when you're blue, Anne, dearie especially the ones of folks you know. If you've any sense of humor at all they'll cheer you up, believe me. I just wish underscore I underscore had the writing of the obituaries of some people. Isn't, obituary, an awful ugly word. This very Peter I've been speaking of had a face exactly like one. I never saw it but I thought of the word obituary then and there. There's only one uglier word that I know of, and that's relict. Lord, Anne, dearie, I may be an old maid, but there's this comfort in it I'll never be any man's, relict. It is an ugly word, said Anne, laughing. Avonlea graveyard was full of old tombstones, sacred to the memory of so-and-so, relict of the late so-and-so. It always made me think of something worn out and moth-eaten. Why is it that so many of the words connected with death are so disagreeable? I do wish that the custom of calling a dead body, the remains, could be abolished. I positively shiver when I hear the undertaker say at a funeral, all who wish to see the remains please step this way. It always gives me the horrible impression that I am about to view the scene of a cannibal feast. Well, all I hope, said Miss Cornelia calmly, is that when I'm dead nobody will call me, our departed sister. I took a scunner at this sister and brothering business five years ago when there was a traveling evangelist holding meetings at the Glen. I hadn't any use for him from the start. I felt in my bones that there was something wrong with him. And there was. Mind you, he was pretending to be a Presbyterian Presbyterian, he called it and all the time he was a Methodist. He brothered and sistered everybody. He had a large circle of relations, that man had. He clutched my hand fervently one night, and said imploringly, My dear sister Bryant, are you a Christian? I just looked him over a bit, and then I said calmly, 
the only brother I ever had, Mr. Fisk, was buried 15 years ago, and I haven't adopted any since. As for being a Christian, I was that, I hope and believe, when you were crawling about the floor in petticoats. That squelched him, believe me. Mind you, Anne Deary, I'm not down on all evangelists. We've had some real fine, earnest men, who did a lot of good and made the old sinners squirm. But this Fisk man wasn't one of them. I had a good laugh all to myself one evening. Fisk had asked all who were Christians to stand up. Underscore I underscore didn't, believe me. I never had any use for that sort of thing. But most of them did, and then he asked all who wanted to be Christians to stand up. Nobody stirred for a spell, so Fisk started up a hymn at the top of his voice. Just in front of me poor little Ikey Baker was sitting in the Millicent pew. He was a homeboy, ten years old, and Millicent just about worked him to death. The poor little creature was always so tired he fell asleep right off whenever he went to church or anywhere he could sit still for a few minutes. He'd been sleeping all through the meeting, and I was thankful to see the poor child getting a rest, believe me. Well, when Fisky's voice went soaring skyward and the rest joined in, poor Ikey wakened with a start. He thought it was just an ordinary singing and that everybody ought to stand up, so he scrambled to his feet mighty quick knowing he'd get a combing down from Maria Millicent for sleeping in meeting. Fisk saw him, stopped and shouted, another soul saved. Glory hallelujah. And there was poor, frightened Ikey, only half awake and yawning, never thinking about his soul at all. Poor child, he never had time to think of anything but his tired, overworked little body. Leslie went one night and the Fisk man got right after her oh. He was especially anxious about the souls of the nice-looking girls, believe me, and he hurt her feelings so she never went again. And then he prayed every night after that, right in public, that the Lord would soften her hard heart. Finally I went to Mr. Leavitt, our minister then, and told him if he didn't make Fisk stop that I'd just rise up the next night and throw my hymn book at him when he mentioned that, beautiful but unrepentant young woman. I'd have done it too. Believe me. Mr. Leavitt did put a stop to it, but Fisk kept on with his meetings until Charlie Douglas put an end to his career in the Glen. Mrs. Charlie had been out in California all winter. She'd been real melancholy in the fall religious melancholy it ran in her family. Her father worried so much over believing that he had committed the unpardonable sin that he died in the asylum. So when Rose Douglas got that way Charlie packed her off to visit her sister in Los Angeles. She got perfectly well and came home just when the Fisk revival was in full swing. She stepped off the train at the Glen, real smiling and chipper, and the first thing she saw staring her in the face on the black, gable end of the freight shed, was the question, in big white letters, two feet high, whither goest thou to heaven or hell? That had been one of Fisky's ideas and he had got Henry Hammond to paint it. Rose just gave a shriek and fainted, and when they got her home she was worse than ever. Charlie Douglas went to Mr. Leavitt and told him that every Douglas would leave the church if Fisk was kept there any longer. Mr. Leavitt had to give in, for the Douglases paid half his salary, so Fisk departed, and we had to depend on our Bibles once more for instructions on how to get to heaven. After he was gone Mr. Leavitt found out he was just a masquerading Methodist, and he felt pretty sick, believe me. Mr. Leavitt fell short in some ways, but he was a good, sound Presbyterian. By the way, I had a letter from Mr. Ford yesterday, said Anne. He asked me to remember him kindly to you. I don't want his remembrances, said Miss Cornelia, curtly. Why, said Anne, in astonishment. I thought you liked him. Well, so I did, in a kind of way. But I'll never forgive him for what he done to Leslie. There's that poor child eating her heart out about him as if she hadn't had trouble enough and him ranting round Toronto, I've no doubt, enjoying himself same as ever. Just like a man. Oh, Miss Cornelia, how did you find out? Lord, Anne, dearie, I've got eyes, haven't I? and I've known Leslie since she was a baby. There's been a new kind of heartbreak in her eyes all the fall, and I know that writer man was behind it somehow. 
I'll never forgive myself for being the means of bringing him here. But I never expected he'd be like he was. I thought he'd just be like the other men Leslie had boarded conceited young asses, every one of them, that she never had any use for. One of them did try to flirt with her once and she froze him out so bad, I feel sure he's never got himself thawed since. So I never thought of any danger. Don't let Leslie suspect you know her secret, said Anne hurriedly. I think it would hurt her. Trust me, Anne, dearie. Underscore I underscore wasn't born yesterday. Oh, a plague on all the men. One of them ruined Leslie's life to begin with, and now another of the tribe comes and makes her still more wretched. Anne, this world is an awful place, believe me. There's something in the world amiss will be unriddled by and by. Quoted Anne dreamily. If it is, it'll be in a world where there aren't any men, said Miss Cornelia gloomily. What have the men been doing now? asked Gilbert, entering. Mischief, mischief. What else did they ever do? It was Eve ate the apple, Miss Cornelia. Twas a he creature tempted her, retorted Miss Cornelia triumphantly. Leslie, after her first anguish was over, found it possible to go on with life after all, as most of us do, no matter what our particular form of torment has been. It is even possible that she enjoyed moments of it, when she was one of the gay circle in the little house of dreams. But if Anne ever hoped that she was forgetting Owen Ford she would have been undeceived by the furtive hunger in Leslie's eyes whenever his name was mentioned. Pitiful to that hunger. Anne always contrived to tell Captain Jim or Gilbert bits of news from Owen's letters when Leslie was with them. The girl's flush and pallor at such moments spoke all too eloquently of the emotion that filled her being. But she never spoke of him to Anne, or mentioned that night on the sandbar. One day her old dog died and she grieved bitterly over him. He's been my friend so long, she said sorrowfully to Anne. He was Dick's old dog. You know Dick had him for a year or so before we were married. He left him with me when he sailed on the Four Sisters. Carlo got very fond of me and his dog love helped me through that first dreadful year after mother died, when I was alone. When I heard that Dick was coming back I was afraid Carlo wouldn't be so much mine. But he never seemed to care for Dick, though he had been so fond of him once. He would snap and growl at him as if he were a stranger. I was glad. It was nice to have one thing whose love was all mine. That old dog has been such a comfort to me, Anne. He got so feeble in the fall that I was afraid he couldn't live long but I hoped I could nurse him through the winter. He seemed pretty well this morning. He was lying on the rug before the fire. Then, all at once, he got up and crept over to me. He put his head on my lap and gave me one loving look out of his big, soft, dog eyes and then he just shivered and died. I shall miss him so. Let me give you another dog, Leslie, said Anne. I'm getting a lovely Gordon setter for a Christmas present for Gilbert. Let me give you one too. Leslie shook her head. Not just now, thank you, Anne. I don't feel like having another dog yet. I don't seem to have any affection left for another. Perhaps in time I'll let you give me one. I really need one as a kind of protection. But there was something almost human about Carlo it wouldn't be decent to fill his place too hurriedly, dear old fellow. Anne went to Avonlea a week before Christmas and stayed until after the holidays. Gilbert came up for her, and there was a glad New Year celebration at Green Gables, when Berries and Blitz and Wrights assembled to devour a dinner which had cost Mrs. Rachel and Marilla much careful thought and preparation. When they went back to Four Winds the little house was almost drifted over, for the third storm of a winter that was to prove phenomenally stormy had whirled up the harbor and heaped huge snow mountains about everything it encountered. But Captain Jim had shoveled out doors and paths, and Miss Cornelia had come down and kindled the hearth fire. It's good to see you back, Anne, dearie. But did you ever see such drifts? You can't see the more place at all unless you go upstairs. Leslie'll be so glad you're back. She's almost buried alive over there. Fortunately Dick can shovel snow, and thinks it's great fun. Susan sent me word to tell you she would be on hand tomorrow. Where are you off to now, Captain? I reckon I'll plow up to the glen and sit a bit with old Martin Strong. 
He's not far from his end and he's lonesome. He hasn't many friends been too busy all his life to make any. He's made heaps of money, though. Well, he thought that since he couldn't serve God and mammon he'd better stick to mammon, said Miss Cornelia crisply. So he shouldn't complain if he doesn't find mammon very good company now. Captain Jim went out, but remembered something in the yard and turned back for a moment. I'd a letter from Mr. Ford, Mistress Blythe and he says the life book is accepted and is going to be published next fall. I felt fair uplifted when I got the news. To think that I'm to see it in print at last. That man is clean crazy on the subject of his life book, said Miss Cornelia compassionately. For my part, I think there's far too many books in the world now. Chapter 29. Gilbert and Anne Disagree. Gilbert laid down the ponderous medical tome over which he had been pouring until the increasing dusk of the March evening made him desist. He leaned back in his chair and gazed meditatively out of the window. It was early spring probably the ugliest time of the year. Not even the sunset could redeem the dead, sodden landscape and rotten black harbor ice upon which he looked. No sign of life was visible, save a big black crow winging his solitary way across a leaden field. Gilbert speculated idly concerning that crow. Was he a family crow, with a black but comely crow wife awaiting him in the woods beyond the glen? Or was he a glossy young buck of a crow on courting thoughts intent? Or was he a cynical bachelor crow, believing that he travels the fastest who travels alone? Whatever he was, he soon disappeared in congenial gloom and Gilbert turned to the cheerier view indoors. The firelight flickered from point to point gleaming on the white and green coats of Gog and Magog, on the sleek, brown head of the beautiful setter basking on the rug, on the picture frames on the walls, on the vaseful of daffodils from the window garden, on Anne herself, sitting by her little table, with her sewing beside her and her hands clasped over her knee while she traced out pictures in the fire castles in Spain whose airy turrets pierced moonlit cloud and sunset bar ships sailing from the haven of good hopes straight to Four Winds Harbor with precious burthen. For Anne was again a dreamer of dreams, albeit a grim shape of fear went with her night and day to shadow and darken her visions. Gilbert was accustomed to refer to himself as, an old married man. But he still looked upon Anne with the incredulous eyes of a lover. He couldn't wholly believe yet that she was really his. It might be only a dream after all, part and parcel of this magic house of dreams. His soul still went on tiptoe before her lest the charm be shattered and the dream dispelled. Anne, he said slowly, lend me your ears. I want to talk with you about something. Anne looked across at him through the fire-lit gloom. What is it? She asked gaily. You look fearfully solemn, Gilbert. I really haven't done anything naughty today. Ask Susan. It's not of you or ourselves I want to talk. It's about Dick Moore. Dick Moore, echoed Anne, sitting up alertly. Why, what in the world have you to say about Dick Moore? I've been thinking a great deal about him lately. Do you remember the time last summer I treated him for those carbuncles on his neck? Yes, yes. I took the opportunity to examine the scars on his head thoroughly. I've always thought Dick was a very interesting case from a medical point of view. Lately I've been studying the history of trephining and the cases where it has been employed. Anne. I have come to the conclusion that if Dick Moore were taken to a good hospital and the operation of trephining performed on several places in his skull, his memory and faculties might be restored. Gilbert. Anne's voice was full of protest. Surely you don't mean it. I do, indeed. And I have decided that it is my duty to broach the subject to Leslie. Gilbert Blythe, you shall not do any such thing, cried Anne vehemently. Oh. Gilbert, you won't you won't. You couldn't be so cruel. Promise me you won't. Why, Anne girl, I didn't suppose you would take it like this. Be reasonable. I won't be reasonable I can't be reasonable I am reasonable. It is you who are unreasonable. Gilbert, have you ever once thought what it would mean for Leslie if Dick Moore were to be restored to his right senses? Just stop and think. She's unhappy enough now. But life as Dick's nurse and attendant is a thousand times easier for her than life as Dick's wife. I know I know. It's unthinkable. 
Don't you meddle with the matter. Leave well enough alone. I have thought over that aspect of the case thoroughly, Anne. But I believe that a doctor is bound to set the sanctity of a patient's mind and body above all other considerations, no matter what the consequences may be. I believe it his duty to endeavor to restore health and sanity, if there is any hope whatever of it. But Dick isn't your patient in that respect, cried Anne, taking another tack. If Leslie had asked you if anything could be done for him, then it might be your duty to tell her what you really thought. But you've no right to meddle. I don't call it meddling. Uncle Dave told Leslie 12 years ago that nothing could be done for Dick. She believes that, of course. And why did Uncle Dave tell her that, if it wasn't true? Cried Anne, triumphantly. Doesn't he know as much about it as you? I think not though it may sound conceited and presumptuous to say it. And you know as well as I that he is rather prejudiced against what he calls, these newfangled notions of cutting and carving. He's even opposed to operating for appendicitis. He's right, exclaimed Anne, with a complete change of front. I believe myself that you modern doctors are entirely too fond of making experiments with human flesh and blood. Rhoda Allenby would not be a living woman today if I had been afraid of making a certain experiment, argued Gilbert. I took the risk and saved her life. I'm sick and tired of hearing about Rhoda Allenby, cried Anne most unjustly, for Gilbert had never mentioned Mrs. Allenby's name since the day he had told Anne of his success in regard to her. And he could not be blamed for other people's discussion of it. Gilbert felt rather hurt. I had not expected you to look at the matter as you do, Anne, he said a little stiffly, getting up and moving towards the office door. It was their first approach to a quarrel. But Anne flew after him and dragged him back. Now, Gilbert, you are not, going off mad. Sit down here and I'll apologize be you tea fully, I shouldn't have said that. But oh, if you knew. Anne checked herself just in time. She had been on the very verge of betraying Leslie's secret. Knew what a woman feels about it, she concluded lamely. I think I do know. I've looked at the matter from every point of view and I've been driven to the conclusion that it is my duty to tell Leslie that I believe it is possible that Dick can be restored to himself, there my responsibility ends. It will be for her to decide what she will do. I don't think you've any right to put such a responsibility on her. She has enough to bear. She is poor how could she afford such an operation? That is for her to decide, persisted Gilbert stubbornly. You say you think that Dick can be cured. But are you sure of it? Certainly not. Nobody could be sure of such a thing. There may have been lesions of the brain itself, the effect of which can never be removed. But if, as I believe, his loss of memory and other faculties is due merely to the pressure on the brain centers of certain depressed areas of bone, then he can be cured. But it's only a possibility, insisted Anne. Now, suppose you tell Leslie and she decides to have the operation. It will cost a great deal. She will have to borrow the money, or sell her little property. And suppose the operation is a failure and Dick remains the same. How will she be able to pay back the money she borrows, or make a living for herself and that big helpless creature if she sells the farm? Oh, I know I know. But it is my duty to tell her. I can't get away from that conviction. Oh, I know the blithe stubbornness, groaned Anne. But don't do this solely in your own responsibility. Consult Dr. Dave. I have done so, said Gilbert reluctantly. And what did he say? In brief as you say leave well enough alone. Apart from his prejudice against newfangled surgery, I'm afraid he looks at the case from your point of view don't do it, for Leslie's sake. There now, cried Anne triumphantly. I do think, Gilbert, that you ought to abide by the judgment of a man nearly eighty, who has seen a great deal and saved scores of lives himself surely his opinion ought to weigh more than a mere boy's. Thank you. Don't laugh. It's too serious. That's just my point. It is serious. Here is a man who is a helpless burden. He may be restored to reason and usefulness. He was so very useful before, interjected Anne witheringly. He may be given a chance to make good and redeem the past. His wife doesn't know this. I do. 
It is therefore my duty to tell her that there is such a possibility. That, boiled down, is my decision. Don't say, decision, yet, Gilbert. Consult somebody else. Ask Captain Jim what he thinks about it. Very well. But I'll not promise to abide by his opinion, Anne. This is something a man must decide for himself. My conscience would never be easy if I kept silent on the subject. Oh, your conscience, moaned Anne. I suppose that Uncle Dave has a conscience too, hasn't he? Yes, but I am not the keeper of his conscience. Come, Anne, if this affair did not concern Leslie if it were a purely abstract case, you would agree with me, you know you would. I wouldn't, vowed Anne, trying to believe it herself. Oh, you can argue all night, Gilbert, but you won't convince me. Just you ask Miss Cornelia what she thinks of it. You're driven to the last ditch, Anne, when you bring up Miss Cornelia as a reinforcement. She will say, just like a man, and rage furiously. No matter. This is no affair for Miss Cornelia to settle. Leslie alone must decide it. You know very well how she will decide it, said Anne, almost in tears. She has ideals of duty, too. I don't see how you can take such a responsibility in your shoulders. Underscore I underscore couldn't. Because right is right to follow right were wisdom in the scorn of consequence. Quoted Gilbert. Oh, you think a couplet of poetry a convincing argument. Scoffed Anne. That is so like a man. And then she laughed in spite of herself. It sounded so like an echo of Miss Cornelia. Well, if you won't accept Tennyson as an authority, Perhaps you will believe the words of a greater than he, said Gilbert seriously. Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. I believe that, Anne, with all my heart. It's the greatest and grandest verse in the Bible or in any literature and the truest, if there are comparative degrees of trueness. And it's the first duty of a man to tell the truth, as he sees it and believes it. In this case the truth won't make poor Leslie free, sighed Anne. It will probably end in still more bitter bondage for her. Oh, Gilbert, I can't think you are right. Chapter 30. Leslie Decides. A sudden outbreak of a virulent type of influenza at the Glen and down at the fishing village kept Gilbert so busy for the next fortnight that he had no time to pay the promised visit to Captain Jim. Anne hoped against hope that he had abandoned the idea about Dick Moore, and, resolving to let sleeping dogs lie she said no more about the subject. But she thought of it incessantly. I wonder if it would be right for me to tell him that Leslie cares for Owen, she thought. He would never let her suspect that he knew, so her pride would not suffer, and it might convince him that he should let Dick Moore alone. Shall I shall I? No, after all, I cannot. A promise is sacred, and I've no right to betray Leslie's secret. But oh, I never felt so worried over anything in my life as I do over this. It's spoiling the spring, it's spoiling everything. One evening Gilbert abruptly proposed that they go down and see Captain Jim. With a sinking heart Anne agreed, and they set forth. Two weeks of kind sunshine had wrought a miracle in the bleak landscape over which Gilbert's crow had flown. The hills and fields were dry and brown and warm, ready to break into bud and blossom. The harbor was laughter shaken again. The long harbor road was like a gleaming red ribbon. Down on the dunes a crowd of boys, who were out smelt fishing, were burning the thick, dry sandhill grass of the preceding summer. The flames swept over the dunes rosily, flinging their cardinal banners against the dark gulf beyond, and illuminating the channel and the fishing village. It was a picturesque scene which would at other times have delighted Anne's eyes, but she was not enjoying this walk. Neither was Gilbert. Their usual good comradeship and Josephian community of taste and viewpoint were sadly lacking. Anne's disapproval of the whole project showed itself in the haughty uplift of her head and the studied politeness of her remarks. Gilbert's mouth was set in all the blithe obstinacy, but his eyes were troubled. He meant to do what he believed to be his duty, but to be at outs with Anne was a high price to pay. Altogether, both were glad when they reached the light and remorseful that they should be glad. Captain Jim put away the fishing net upon which he was working, and welcomed them joyfully. 
In the searching light of the spring evening he looked older than Anne had ever seen him. His hair had grown much grayer, and the strong old hand shook a little. But his blue eyes were clear and steady, and the staunch soul looked out through them gallant and unafraid. Captain Jim listened in amazed silence while Gilbert said what he had come to say. Anne, who knew how the old man worshipped Leslie, felt quite sure that he would side with her, although she had not much hope that this would influence Gilbert. She was therefore surprised beyond measure when Captain Jim, slowly and sorrowfully, but unhesitatingly, gave it as his opinion that Leslie should be told. Oh, Captain Jim, I didn't think you'd say that, she exclaimed reproachfully. I thought you wouldn't want to make more trouble for her. Captain Jim shook his head. I don't want to. I know how you feel about it, Mistress Blythe just as I feel myself. But it ain't our feelings we have to steer by through life no. No, we'd make shipwreck mighty often if we did that. There's only the one safe compass and we've got to set our course by that what it's right to do. I agree with the doctor. If there's a chance for Dick, Leslie should be told of it. There's no two sides to that, in my opinion. Well, said Anne, giving up in despair, wait until Miss Cornelia gets after you two men. Cornelia'll rake us fore and aft, no doubt, assented Captain Jim. You women are lovely critters, Mistress Blythe, but you're just a mite illogical. You're a highly educated lady and Cornelia isn't, but you're like as two peas when it comes to that. I dunno's you're any the worse for it. Logic is a sort of hard, merciless thing, I reckon. Now, I'll brew a cup of tea and we'll drink it and talk of pleasant things, just to calm our minds a bit. At least, Captain Jim's tea and conversation calmed Anne's mind to such an extent that she did not make Gilbert suffer so acutely on the way home as she had deliberately intended to do. She did not refer to the burning question at all, but she chatted amiably of other matters, and Gilbert understood that he was forgiven under protest. Captain Jim seems very frail and bent this spring. The winter has aged him, said Anne sadly. I am afraid that he will soon be going to seek lost Margaret. I can't bear to think of it. Four winds won't be the same place when Captain Jim sets out to sea, agreed Gilbert. The following evening he went to the house up the brook. Anne wandered dismally around until his return. Well, what did Leslie say? She demanded when he came in. Very little. I think she felt rather dazed. And is she going to have the operation? She is going to think it over and decide very soon. Gilbert flung himself wearily into the easy chair before the fire. He looked tired. It had not been an easy thing for him to tell Leslie. And the terror that had sprung into her eyes when the meaning of what he told her came home to her was not a pleasant thing to remember. Now, when the die was cast, he was beset with doubts of his own wisdom. Anne looked at him remorsefully. Then she slipped down on the rug beside him and laid her glossy red head on his arm. Gilbert, I've been rather hateful over this. I won't be any more. Please just call me red-headed and forgive me. By which Gilbert understood that, no matter what came of it, there would be no I told you so's. But he was not wholly comforted. Duty in the abstract is one thing, duty in the concrete is quite another, especially when the doer is confronted by a woman's stricken eyes. Some instinct made Anne keep away from Leslie for the next three days. On the third evening Leslie came down to the little house and told Gilbert that she had made up her mind, she would take Dick to Montreal and have the operation. She was very pale and seemed to have wrapped herself in her old mantle of aloofness. But her eyes had lost the look which had haunted Gilbert, they were cold and bright, and she proceeded to discuss details with him in a crisp, business-like way. There were plans to be made and many things to be thought over. When Leslie had got the information she wanted she went home. Anne wanted to walk part of the way with her. Better not, said Leslie curtly. Today's rain has made the ground damp. Good night. Have I lost my friend? Said Anne with a sigh. If the operation is successful and Dick Moore finds himself again Leslie will retreat into some remote fastness of her soul where none of us can ever find her. Perhaps she will leave him, said Gilbert. Leslie would never do that, Gilbert. Her sense of duty is very strong.
She told me once that her grandmother West always impressed upon her the fact that when she assumed any responsibility she must never shirk it, no matter what the consequences might be. That is one of her cardinal rules. I suppose it's very old-fashioned. Don't be bitter, Anne girl. You know you don't think it old-fashioned. You know you have the very same idea of sacredness of assumed responsibilities yourself. And you were right. Shirking responsibilities is the curse of our modern life the secret of all the unrest and discontent that is seething in the world. Thus saith the preacher, mocked Anne. But under the mockery she felt that he was right, and she was very sick at heart for Leslie. A week later Miss Cornelia descended like an avalanche upon the little house. Gilbert was away and Anne was compelled to bear the shock of the impact alone. Miss Cornelia hardly waited to get her hat off before she began. Anne, do you mean to tell me it's true what I've heard that Dr. Bleed has told Leslie Dick can be cured, and that she is going to take him to Montreal to have him operated on? Yes, it is quite true, Miss Cornelia, said Anne bravely. Well, it's inhuman cruelty, that's what it is, said Miss Cornelia, violently agitated. I did think Dr. Bleed was a decent man. I didn't think he could have been guilty of this. Dr. Bleed thought it was his duty to tell Leslie that there was a chance for Dick, said Anne with spirit, and, she added, loyalty to Gilbert getting the better of her, I agree with him. Oh, no, you don't, dearie, said Miss Cornelia. No person with any bowels of compassion could. Captain Jim does. Don't quote that old ninny to me cried Miss Cornelia. And I don't care who agrees with him. Think think what it means to that poor hunted, harried girl. We do think of it. But Gilbert believes that a doctor should put the welfare of a patient's mind and body before all other considerations. That's just like a man. But I expected better things of you, Anne, said Miss Cornelia, more in sorrow than in wrath. Then she proceeded to bombard Anne with precisely the same arguments with which the latter had attacked Gilbert, and Anne valiantly defended her husband with the weapons he had used for his own protection. Long was the fray, but Miss Cornelia made an end at last. It's an iniquitous shame, she declared, almost in tears. That's just what it is an iniquitous shame. Poor, poor Leslie. Don't you think Dick should be considered a little too? pleaded Anne. Dick. Dick Moore. He's happy enough. He's a better behaved and more reputable member of society now than he ever was before. Why, he was a drunkard and perhaps worse. Are you going to set him loose again to roar and to devour? He may reform, said poor Anne, beset by foe without and traitor within. Reform your grandmother, retorted Miss Cornelia. Dick Moore got the injuries that left him as he is in a drunken brawl. He deserves his fate. It was sent on him for a punishment. I don't believe the doctor has any business to tamper with the visitations of God. Nobody knows how Dick was hurt, Miss Cornelia. It may not have been in a drunken brawl at all. He may have been waylaid and robbed. Pigs may whistle, but they've poor mouths for it, said Miss Cornelia. Well, the gist of what you tell me is that the thing is settled and there's no use in talking. If that's so I'll hold my tongue. I don't propose to wear my teeth out gnawing files. When a thing has to be I give in to it. But I like to make mighty sure first that it has to be. Now, I'll devote my energies to comforting and sustaining Leslie. And after all, added Miss Cornelia, brightening up hopefully, perhaps nothing can be done for Dick. Chapter 31. The Truth Makes Free. Leslie, having once made up her mind what to do, proceeded to do it with characteristic resolution and speed. House cleaning must be finished with first, whatever issues of life and death might await beyond. The grey house up the brook was put into flawless order and cleanliness, with Miss Cornelia's ready assistance. Miss Cornelia, having said her say to Anne, and later on to Gilbert and Captain Jim sparing neither of them, let it be assured never spoke of the matter to Leslie. She accepted the fact of Dick's operation, referred to it when necessary in a business-like way, and ignored it when it was not. Leslie never attempted to discuss it. She was very cold and quiet during these beautiful spring days. She seldom visited Anne, 
and though she was invariably courteous and friendly, that very courtesy was as an icy barrier between her and the people of the little house. The old jokes and laughter and chumminess of common things could not reach her over it. Anne refused to feel hurt. She knew that Leslie was in the grip of a hideous dread a dread that wrapped her away from all little glimpses of happiness and hours of pleasure. When one great passion seizes possession of the soul all other feelings are crowded aside. Never in all her life had Leslie Moore shuddered away from the future with more intolerable terror. But she went forward as unswervingly in the path she had elected as the martyrs of old walked their chosen way, knowing the end of it to be the fiery agony of the stake. The financial question was settled with greater ease than Anne had feared. Leslie borrowed the necessary money from Captain Jim, and, at her insistence, he took a mortgage on the little farm. So that is one thing off the poor girl's mind, Miss Cornelia told Anne, and off mine too. Now, if Dick gets well enough to work again he'll be able to earn enough to pay the interest on it, and if he doesn't I know Captain Jim will manage some way that Leslie won't have to. He said as much to me. I'm getting old, Cornelia, he said, and I've no chick or child of my own. Leslie won't take a gift from a living man, but maybe she will from a dead one. So it will be all right as far as that goes. I wish everything else might be settled as satisfactorily. As for that wretch of a dick, he's been awful these last few days. The devil was in him, believe me. Leslie and I couldn't get on with our work for the tricks he'd play. He chased all her ducks one day around the yard till most of them died. And not one thing would he do for us. Sometimes, you know, he'll make himself quite handy, bringing in pails of water and wood. But this week if we sent him to the well he'd try to climb down into it. I thought once, if you'd only shoot down their head first everything would be nicely settled. Oh, Miss Cornelia. Now, you needn't Miss Cornelia me, Anne, dearie. Anybody would have thought the same. If the Montreal doctors can make a rational creature out of Dick Moore their wonders. Leslie took Dick to Montreal early in May. Gilbert went with her, to help her, and make the necessary arrangements for her. He came home with the report that the Montreal surgeon whom they had consulted agreed with him that there was a good chance of Dick's restoration. Very comforting, was Miss Cornelia's sarcastic comment. Anne only sighed. Leslie had been very distant at their parting. But she had promised to write. Ten days after Gilbert's return the letter came. Leslie wrote that the operation had been successfully performed and that Dick was making a good recovery. What does she mean by, successfully? Asked Anne. Does she mean that Dick's memory is really restored? Not likely since she says nothing of it, said Gilbert. She uses the word, successfully, from the surgeon's point of view. The operation has been performed and followed by normal results. But it is too soon to know whether Dick's faculties will be eventually restored, wholly or in part. His memory would not be likely to return to him all at once. The process will be gradual, if it occurs at all. Is that all she says? Yes there's her letter. It's very short. Poor girl, she must be under a terrible strain. Gilbert Blythe, there are heaps of things I long to say to you, only it would be mean. Miss Cornelia says them for you, said Gilbert with a rueful smile. She combs me down every time I encounter her. She makes it plain to me that she regards me as little better than a murderer, and that she thinks it a great pity that Dr. Dave ever let me step into his shoes. She even told me that the Methodist doctor over the harbor was to be preferred before me. With Miss Cornelia the force of condemnation can no further go. If Cornelia Bryant was sick, it would not be Dr. Dave or the Methodist doctor she would send for, sniffed Susan. She would have you out of your hard-earned bed in the middle of the night, doctor, dear, if she took a spell of misery, that she would. And then she would likely say your bill was past all reason. But do not mind her, doctor, dear. It takes all kinds of people to make a world. No further word came from Leslie for some time. The May days crept away in a sweet succession and the shores of Four Winds Harbor greened and bloomed and purpled. One day in late May Gilbert came home to be met by Susan in the stable yard. 
I am afraid something has upset Mrs. Doctor. Doctor, dear, she said mysteriously. She got a letter this afternoon and since then she has just been walking round the garden and talking to herself. You know it is not good for her to be on her feet so much, doctor, dear. She did not see fit to tell me what her news was, and I am no pry, doctor, dear, and never was, but it is plain something has upset her. And it is not good for her to be upset. Gilbert hurried rather anxiously to the garden. Had anything happened at Green Gables? But Anne, sitting on the rustic seat by the brook, did not look troubled, though she was certainly much excited. Her eyes were their grayest, and scarlet spots burned on her cheeks. What has happened, Anne? Anne gave a queer little laugh. I think you'll hardly believe it when I tell you, Gilbert. Underscore I underscore can't believe it yet. As Susan said the other day, I feel like a fly coming to live in the sun dazed like. It's all so incredible. I've read the letter a score of times and every time it's just the same I can't believe my own eyes. Oh, Gilbert, you were right so right. I can see that clearly enough now and I'm so ashamed of myself and will you ever really forgive me? Anne, I'll shake you if you don't grow coherent. Redmond would be ashamed of you. What has happened? You won't believe it you won't believe it. I'm going to phone for Uncle Dave, said Gilbert, pretending to start for the house. Sit down, Gilbert. I'll try to tell you. I've had a letter, and oh, Gilbert, it's all so amazing so incredibly amazing we never thought not one of us ever dreamed. I suppose, said Gilbert, sitting down with a resigned air, the only thing to do in a case of this kind is to have patience and go at the matter categorically. Whom is your letter from? Leslie and, oh, Gilbert. Leslie. Phew. What has she to say? What's the news about Dick? Anne lifted the letter and held it out, calmly dramatic in a moment. There is no Dick. The man we have thought Dick Moore whom everybody in Four Winds has believed for twelve years to be Dick Moore is his cousin, George Moore, of Nova Scotia, who, it seems, always resembled him very strikingly. Dick Moore died of yellow fever 13 years ago in Cuba. Chapter 32. Miss Cornelia discusses the affair. And do you mean to tell me, Anne, dearie, that Dick Moore has turned out not to be Dick Moore at all but somebody else? Is that what you phoned up to me today? Yes, Miss Cornelia. It is very amazing, isn't it? It's it's just like a man, said Miss Cornelia helplessly. She took off her hat with trembling fingers. For once in her life Miss Cornelia was undeniably staggered. I can't seem to sense it, Anne, she said. I've heard you say it and I believe you but I can't take it in. Dick Moore is dead has been dead all these years and Leslie is free. Yes, the truth has made her free. Gilbert was right when he said that verse was the grandest in the Bible. Tell me everything, Anne, dearie. Since I got your phone I've been in a regular muddle. Believe me. Cornelia Bryant was never so kerflumuxed before. There isn't a very great deal to tell. Leslie's letter was short. She didn't go into particulars. This man George Moore has recovered his memory and knows who he is. He says Dick took yellow fever in Cuba, and the four sisters had to sail without him. George stayed behind to nurse him. But he died very shortly afterwards. George did not write Leslie because he intended to come right home and tell her himself. And why didn't he? I suppose his accident must have intervened. Gilbert says it is quite likely that George Moore remembers nothing of his accident, or what led to it, and may never remember it. It probably happened very soon after Dick's death. We may find out more particulars when Leslie writes again. Does she say what she is going to do? When is she coming home? She says she will stay with George Moore until he can leave the hospital. She has written to his people in Nova Scotia. It seems that George's only near relative is a married sister much older than himself. She was living when George sailed on the Four Sisters, but of course we do not know what may have happened since. Did you ever see George Moore, Miss Cornelia? I did. It is all coming back to me. He was here visiting his uncle Abner 18 years ago when he and Dick would be about 17. 
They were double cousins. You see. Their fathers were brothers and their mothers were twin sisters, and they did look a terrible lot alike. Of course, added Miss Cornelia scornfully, it wasn't one of those freak resemblances you read of in novels where two people are so much alike that they can fill each other's places and their nearest and dearest can't tell between them. In those days you could tell easy enough which was George and which was Dick, if you saw them together and near at hand. Apart, or some distance away, it wasn't so easy. They played lots of tricks on people and thought it great fun, the two scamps. George Moore was a little taller and a good deal fatter than Dick though neither of them was what you would call fat they were both of the lean kind. Dick had higher color than George, and his hair was a shade lighter. But their features were just alike, and they both had that queer freak of eyes one blue and one hazel. They weren't much alike in any other way, though. George was a real nice fellow, though he was a scalawag for mischief, and some said he had a liking for a glass even then. But everybody liked him better than Dick. He spent about a month here. Leslie never saw him. She was only about eight or nine then and I remember now that she spent that whole winter over harbor with her grandmother West. Captain Jim was away, too that was the winter he was wrecked on the Magdalens. I don't suppose either he or Leslie had ever heard about the Nova Scotia cousin looking so much like Dick. Nobody ever thought of him when Captain Jim brought Dick George, I should say home. Of course, we all thought Dick had changed considerable he'd got so lumpish and fat. But we put that down to what had happened to him, and no doubt that was the reason, for, as I've said, George wasn't fat to begin with either. And there was no other way we could have guessed, for the man's senses were clean gone. I can't see that it is any wonder we were all deceived. But it's a staggering thing. And Leslie has sacrificed the best years of her life to nursing a man who hadn't any claim on her. Oh, drat the men. No matter what they do, it's the wrong thing. And no matter who they are, it's somebody they shouldn't be. They do exasperate me. Gilbert and Captain Jim are men, and it is through them that the truth has been discovered at last, said Anne. Well, I admit that, conceded Miss Cornelia reluctantly. I'm sorry I raked the doctor off so. It's the first time in my life I've ever felt ashamed of anything I said to a man. I don't know as I shall tell him so, though. He'll just have to take it for granted. Well, Anne, dearie, it's a mercy the Lord doesn't answer all our prayers. I've been praying hard right along that the operation wouldn't cure Dick. Of course I didn't put it just quite so plain. But that was what was in the back of my mind and I have no doubt the Lord knew it. Well, he has answered the spirit of your prayer. You really wished that things shouldn't be made any harder for Leslie. I'm afraid that in my secret heart I've been hoping the operation wouldn't succeed, and I am wholesomely ashamed of it. How does Leslie seem to take it? She writes like one dazed. I think that, like ourselves, she hardly realizes it yet. She says, it all seems like a strange dream to me, Anne. That is the only reference she makes to herself. Poor child. I suppose when the chains are struck off a prisoner he'd feel queer and lost without them for a while. Anne, dearie, here's a thought keeps coming into my mind. What about Owen Ford? We both know Leslie was fond of him. Did it ever occur to you that he was fond of her? It did once, admitted Anne, feeling that she might say so much. Well, I hadn't any reason to think he was, but it just appeared to me he must be. Now, Anne, dearie, the Lord knows I'm not a matchmaker, and I scorn all such doings. But if I were you and writing to that Ford man I'd just mention, casual like, what has happened? That is what underscore I underscore, D do. Of course I will mention it when I write him, said Anne, a trifle distantly. Somehow, this was a thing she could not discuss with Miss Cornelia. And yet, she had to admit that the same thought had been lurking in her mind ever since she had heard of Leslie's freedom. But she would not desecrate it by free speech. Of course there is no great rush, dearie. But Dick Moore's been dead for 13 years and Leslie has wasted enough of her life for him. We'll just see what comes of it. As for this George Moore who's gone and come back to life when everyone thought he was dead and done for.
Just like a man, I'm real sorry for him. He won't seem to fit in anywhere. He is still a young man, and if he recovers completely, as seems likely, he will be able to make a place for himself again. It must be very strange for him, poor fellow. I suppose all these years since his accident will not exist for him. Chapter 33 Leslie Returns A fortnight later Leslie Moore came home alone to the old house where she had spent so many bitter years. In the June twilight she went over the fields to Anne's, and appeared with ghost-like suddenness in the scented garden. Leslie, cried Anne in amazement, where have you sprung from? We never knew you were coming. Why didn't you write? We would have met you. I couldn't write somehow, Anne. It seems so futile to try to say anything with pen and ink. And I wanted to get back quietly and unobserved. Anne put her arms about Leslie and kissed her. Leslie returned the kiss warmly. She looked pale and tired, and she gave a little sigh as she dropped down on the grasses beside a great bed of daffodils that were gleaming through the pale, silvery twilight like golden stars. And you have come home alone, Leslie? Yes. George Moore's sister came to Montreal and took him home with her. Poor fellow, he was sorry to part with me though I was a stranger to him when his memory first came back. He clung to me in those first hard days when he was trying to realize that Dick's death was not the thing of yesterday that it seemed to him. It was all very hard for him. I helped him all I could. When his sister came it was easier for him, because it seemed to him only the other day that he had seen her last. Fortunately she had not changed much, and that helped him, too. It is all so strange and wonderful, Leslie. I think we none of us realize it yet. I cannot. When I went into the house over there an hour ago, I felt that it must be a dream that Dick must be there, with his childish smile, as he had been for so long. Anne, I seem stunned yet. I'm not glad or sorry or anything. I feel as if something had been torn suddenly out of my life and left a terrible hole. I feel as if I couldn't be underscore I underscore, as if I must have changed into somebody else and couldn't get used to it. It gives me a horrible lonely, dazed, helpless feeling. It's good to see you again it seems as if you were a sort of anchor for my drifting soul. Oh, Anne, I dreaded all the gossip and wonderment and questioning. When I think of that, I wish that I need not have come home at all. Dr. Dave was at the station when I came off the train he brought me home. Poor old man, he feels very badly because he told me years ago that nothing could be done for Dick. I honestly thought so, Leslie, he said to me today. But I should have told you not to depend on my opinion I should have told you to go to a specialist. If I had, you would have been saved many bitter years, and poor George Moore many wasted ones. I blame myself very much, Leslie. I told him not to do that he had done what he thought right. He has always been so kind to me I couldn't bear to see him worrying over it. And Dick George, I mean, is his memory fully restored? Practically. Of course, there are a great many details he can't recall yet but he remembers more and more every day. He went out for a walk on the evening after Dick was buried. He had Dick's money and watch on him. He meant to bring them home to me, along with my letter. He admits he went to a place where the sailors resorted and he remembers drinking and nothing else. Anne. I shall never forget the moment he remembered his own name. I saw him looking at me with an intelligent but puzzled expression. I said, do you know me, Dick? He answered, I never saw you before. Who are you? And my name is not Dick. I am George Moore, and Dick died of yellow fever yesterday. Where am I? What has happened to me? I, I fainted, Anne. And ever since I have felt as if I were in a dream. You will soon adjust yourself to this new state of things, Leslie. And your young life is before you you will have many beautiful years yet. Perhaps I shall be able to look at it in that way after a while, Anne. Just now I feel too tired and indifferent to think about the future. I'm I'm Anne, I'm lonely. I miss Dick. Isn't it all very strange? Do you know, I was really fond of poor Dick George. I suppose I should say just as I would have been fond of a helpless child who depended on me for everything. 
I would never have admitted it I was really ashamed of it because, you see, I had hated and despised Dick so much before he went away. When I heard that Captain Jim was bringing him home I expected I would just feel the same to him. But I never did although I continued to loathe him as I remembered him before. From the time he came home I felt only pity a pity that hurt and wrung me. I suppose then that it was just because his accident had made him so helpless and changed. But now I believe it was because there was really a different personality there. Carlo knew it, and I know now that Carlo knew it. I always thought it strange that Carlo shouldn't have known Dick. Dogs are usually so faithful. But he knew it was not his master who had come back, although none of the rest of us did. I had never seen George Moore, you know. I remember now that Dick once mentioned casually that he had a cousin in Nova Scotia who looked as much like him as a twin, but the thing had gone out of my memory, and in any case I would never have thought it of any importance. You see, it never occurred to me to question Dick's identity. Any change in him seemed to me just the result of the accident. Oh, Anne, that night in April when Gilbert told me he thought Dick might be cured. I can never forget it. It seemed to me that I had once been a prisoner in a hideous cage of torture, and then the door had been opened and I could get out. I was still chained to the cage but I was not in it. And that night I felt that a merciless hand was drawing me back into the cage back to a torture even more terrible than it had once been. I didn't blame Gilbert. I felt he was right. And he had been very good he said that if, in view of the expense and uncertainty of the operation, I should decide not to risk it, he would not blame me in the least. But I knew how I ought to decide and I couldn't face it. All night I walked the floor like a mad woman, trying to compel myself to face it. I couldn't, and I thought I couldn't and when morning broke I set my teeth and resolved that I wouldn't. I would let things remain as they were. It was very wicked, I know. It would have been just punishment for such wickedness if I had just been left to abide by that decision. I kept to it all day. That afternoon I had to go up to the Glen to do some shopping. It was one of Dick's quiet, drowsy days, so I left him alone. I was gone a little longer than I had expected, and he missed me. He felt lonely, and when I got home, he ran to meet me just like a child, with such a pleased smile on his face. Somehow, Anne, I just gave way then. That smile on his poor vacant face was more than I could endure. I felt as if I were denying a child the chance to grow and develop. I knew that I must give him his chance, no matter what the consequences might be. So I came over and told Gilbert. Oh, Anne, you must have thought me hateful in those weeks before I went away. I didn't mean to be but I couldn't think of anything except what I had to do and everything and everybody about me were like shadows. I know I understood, Leslie. And now it is all over your chain is broken there is no cage. There is no cage, repeated Leslie absently, plucking at the fringing grasses with her slender, brown hands. But it doesn't seem as if there were anything else, Anne. You you remember what I told you of my folly that night on the sandbar? I find one doesn't get over being a fool very quickly. Sometimes I think there are people who are fools forever. And to be a fool of that kind is almost as bad as being a, a dog on a chain. You will feel very differently after you get over being tired and bewildered, said Anne, who, knowing a certain thing that Leslie did not know, did not feel herself called upon to waste over much sympathy. Leslie laid her splendid golden head against Anne's knee. Anyhow, I have you, she said. Life can't be altogether empty with such a friend. Anne, pat my head just as if I were a little girl mother me a bit and let me tell you while my stubborn tongue is loosed a little just what you and your comradeship have meant to me since that night I met you on the rock shore. Chapter 34 The Ship O Dreams Comes to Harbor One morning, when a windy golden sunrise was billowing over the gulf in waves of light, a certain weary stork flew over the bar of Four Winds Harbor on his way from the land of evening stars. Under his wing was tucked a sleepy, starry-eyed, little creature. The stork was tired, and he looked wistfully about him. He knew he was somewhere near his destination, but he could not yet see it. The big, 
White Lighthouse on the Red Sandstone Cliff had its good points. But no stork possessed of any gumption would leave a new, velvet baby there. An old grey house, surrounded by willows, in a blossomy brook valley, looked more promising, but did not seem quite the thing either. The staring green abode further on was manifestly out of the question. Then the stork brightened up. He had caught sight of the very place a little white house nestled against a big, whispering firwood, with a spiral of blue smoke winding up from its kitchen chimney a house which just looked as if it were meant for babies. The stork gave a sigh of satisfaction, and softly alighted on the ridge pole. Half an hour later Gilbert ran down the hall and tapped on the spare room door. A drowsy voice answered him and in a moment Marilla's pale, scared face peeped out from behind the door. Marilla, Anne has sent me to tell you that a certain young gentleman has arrived here. He hasn't brought much luggage with him, but he evidently means to stay. For pity's sake, said Marilla blankly, you don't mean to tell me, Gilbert, that it's all over. Why wasn't I called? Anne wouldn't let us disturb you when there was no need. Nobody was called until about two hours ago. There was no, passage perilous, this time. And in Gilbert will this baby live? He certainly will. He weighs ten pounds and why? Listen to him. Nothing wrong with his lungs, is there? The nurse says his hair will be red. Anne is furious with her, and I'm tickled to death. That was a wonderful day in the little house of dreams. The best dream of all has come true, said Anne, pale and rapturous. Oh, Marilla, I hardly dare believe it, after that horrible day last summer. I have had a heartache ever since then but it is gone now. This baby will take Joy's place, said Marilla. Oh, no, 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 Marilla. He can't nothing can ever do that. He has his own place, my dear, wee man-child. But little Joy has hers, and always will have it. If she had lived she would have been over a year old. She would have been toddling around on her tiny feet and lisping a few words. I can see her so plainly, Marilla. Oh, I know now that Captain Jim was right when he said God would manage better than that my baby would seem a stranger to me when I found her beyond. I've learned that this past year. I've followed her development day by day and week by week I always shall. I shall know just how she grows from year to year and when I meet her again I'll know her she won't be a stranger. Oh, Marilla, look at his dear, darling toes. Isn't it strange they should be so perfect? It would be stranger if they weren't, said Marilla crisply. Now that all was safely over, Marilla was herself again. Oh, I know but it seems as if they couldn't be quite finished, you know and they are, even to the tiny nails. And his hands just look at his hands, Marilla. They appear to be a good deal like hands, Marilla conceded. See how he clings to my finger. I'm sure he knows me already. He cries when the nurse takes him away. Oh, Marilla, do you think you don't think, do you that his hair is going to be red? I don't see much hair of any color, said Marilla. I wouldn't worry about it, if I were you, until it becomes visible. Marilla, he has hair look at that fine little down all over his head. Anyway, nurse says his eyes will be hazel and his forehead is exactly like Gilbert's. And he has the nicest little ears, Mrs. Doctor, dear, said Susan. The first thing I did was to look at his ears. Hair is deceitful and noses and eyes change, and you cannot tell what is going to come of them, but ears is ears from start to finish, and you always know where you are with them. Just look at their shape and they are set right back against his precious head. You will never need to be ashamed of his ears, Mrs. Doctor, dear. Anne's convalescence was rapid and happy. Folks came and worshipped the baby, as people have bowed before the kingship of the newborn since long before the wise men of the East knelt in homage to the royal babe of the Bethlehem manger. Leslie, slowly finding herself amid the new conditions of her life, hovered over it, like a beautiful, golden-crowned Madonna. Miss Cornelia nursed it as knackily as could any mother in Israel. Captain Jim held the small creature in his big brown hands and gazed tenderly at it, with eyes that saw the children who had never been born to him. What are you going to call him? asked Miss Cornelia, 
Anne has settled his name, answered Gilbert. James Matthew after the two finest gentlemen I've ever known not even saving your presence, said Anne with a saucy glance at Gilbert. Gilbert smiled. I never knew Matthew very well. He was so shy we boys couldn't get acquainted with him but I quite agree with you that Captain Jim is one of the rarest and finest souls God ever clothed in clay. He is so delighted over the fact that we have given his name to our small lad. It seems he has no other namesake. Well, James Matthew is a name that will wear well and not fade in the washing, said Miss Cornelia. I'm glad you didn't load him down with some highfalutin romantic name that he'd be ashamed of when he gets to be a grandfather. Mrs. William Drew at the Glen has called her baby Bertie Shakespeare. Quite a combination, isn't it? And I'm glad you haven't had much trouble picking on a name. Some folks have an awful time. When the Stanley Flag's first boy was born there was so much rivalry as to who the child should be named for that the poor little soul had to go for two years without a name. Then a brother came along and there it was. Big Baby, and Little Baby. Finally they called Big Baby Peter and Little Baby Isaac, after the two grandfathers, and had them both christened together. And each tried to see if it couldn't howl the other down. You know that Highland Scotch family of MacNabs back of the Glen. They've got twelve boys and the oldest and the youngest are both called Neil Big Neil and Little Neil in the same family. Well, I suppose they ran out of names. I have read somewhere, laughed Anne, that the first child is a poem but the tenth is very prosy prose. Perhaps Mrs. McNabb thought that the twelfth was merely an old tale retold. Well, there's something to be said for large families, said Miss Cornelia, with a sigh. I was an only child for eight years and I did long for a brother and sister. Mother told me to pray for one and pray I did, believe me. Well, one day Aunt Nellie came to me and said, Cornelia, there is a little brother for you upstairs in your ma's room. You can go up and see him. I was so excited and delighted I just flew upstairs. And old Mrs. Flagg lifted up the baby for me to see. Lord, Anne, dearie, I never was so disappointed in my life. You see, I'd been praying for a brother two years older than myself. How long did it take you to get over your disappointment? asked Anne, amid her laughter. Well, I had a spite at Providence for a good spell, and for weeks I wouldn't even look at the baby. Nobody knew why, for I never told. Then he began to get real cute, and held out his wee hands to me and I began to get fond of him. But I didn't get really reconciled to him until one day a school chum came to see him and said she thought he was awful small for his age. I just got boiling mad, and I sailed right into her and told her she didn't know a nice baby when she saw one, and ours was the nicest baby in the world. And after that I just worshipped him. Mother died before he was three years old and I was sister and mother to him both. Poor little lad, he was never strong, and he died when he wasn't much over twenty. Seems to me I'd have given anything on earth, Anne, dearie, if he'd only lived. Miss Cornelia sighed. Gilbert had gone down and Leslie, who had been crooning over the small James Matthew in the dormer window, laid him asleep in his basket and went her way. As soon as she was safely out of earshot, Miss Cornelia bent forward and said in a conspirator's whisper, Anne, dearie, I'd a letter from Owen Ford yesterday. He's in Vancouver just now, but he wants to know if I can board him for a month later on. You know what that means. Well, I hope we're doing right. We've nothing to do with it we couldn't prevent him from coming to Four Winds if he wanted to, said Anne quickly. She did not like the feeling of matchmaking Miss Cornelia's whispers gave her, and then she weakly succumbed herself. Don't let Leslie know he is coming until he is here, she said. If she found out I feel sure she would go away at once. She intends to go in the fall anyhow she told me so the other day. She is going to Montreal to take up nursing and make what she can of her life. Oh, well, Anne, dearie, said Miss Cornelia, nodding sagely, that is all as it may be. You and I have done our part and we must leave the rest to higher hands. Chapter 35. Politics at Four Winds. When Anne came downstairs again, the island, as well as all Canada, 
was in the throes of a campaign preceding a general election. Gilbert, who was an ardent conservative, found himself caught in the vortex, being much in demand for speech-making at the various county rallies. Miss Cornelia did not approve of his mixing up in politics and told Anne so. Dr. Dave never did it. Dr. Bleed will find he is making a mistake, believe me. Politics is something no decent man should meddle with. Is the government of the country to be left solely to the rogues then? Asked Anne. Yes so long as it's conservative rogues, said Miss Cornelia, marching off with the honors of war. Men and politicians are all tarred with the same brush. The grits have it laid on thicker than the conservatives, that's all considerably thicker. But grit or Tory, my advice to Dr. Bleed is to steer clear of politics. First thing you know, he'll be running an election himself, and going off to Ottawa for half the year and leaving his practice to go to the dogs. Ah, well, let's not borrow trouble, said Anne. The rate of interest is too high. Instead, let's look at little Jem. It should be spelled with a G. Isn't he perfectly beautiful? Just see the dimples in his elbows. We'll bring him up to be a good conservative, you and I, Miss Cornelia. Bring him up to be a good man, said Miss Cornelia. They're scarce and valuable, though, mind you, I wouldn't like to see him a grit. As for the election, you and I may be thankful we don't live over harbor. The air there is blue these days. Every Elliot and Crawford and McAllister is on the warpath, loaded for bear. This side is peaceful and calm seeing there's so few men. Captain Jim's a grit, but it's my opinion he's ashamed of it, for he never talks politics. There isn't any earthly doubt that the conservatives will be returned with a big majority again. Miss Cornelia was mistaken. On the morning after the election Captain Jim dropped in at the little house to tell the news. So virulent is the microbe of party politics, even in a peaceable old man that Captain Jim's cheeks were flushed and his eyes were flashing with all his old-time fire. Mistress Blythe, the Liberals are in with a sweeping majority. After 18 years of Tory mismanagement this downtrodden country is going to have a chance at last. I never heard you make such a bitter partisan speech before, Captain Jim. I didn't think you had so much political venom in you, laughed Anne, who was not much excited over the tidings. Little Jem had said, wow gah, that morning. What were principalities and powers, the rise and fall of dynasties, the overthrow of Grit or Tory, compared with that miraculous occurrence? It's been accumulating for a long while, said Captain Jim, with a deprecating smile. I thought I was only a moderate grit, but when the news came that we were and I found out how gritty I really was. You know the doctor and I are conservatives. Ah, well, it's the only bad thing I know of either of you, Mistress Blythe. Cornelia is a Tory, too. I called in on my way from the Glen to tell her the news. Didn't you know you took your life in your hands? Yes, but I couldn't resist the temptation. How did she take it? Comparatively calm, Mistress Blythe, comparatively calm. She says, says she, well, Providence sends seasons of humiliation to a country, same as to individuals. You grits have been cold and hungry for many a year. Make haste to get warmed and fed, for you won't be in long. Well, now Cornelia, I says, maybe Providence thinks Canada needs a real long spell of humiliation. Ah, Susan, have you heard the news? The liberals are in. Susan had just come in from the kitchen, attended by the odor of delectable dishes which always seemed to hover around her. Now, are they, she said, with beautiful unconcern. Well, I never could see but that my bread rose just as light when grits were in as when they were not. And if any party, Mrs. Doctor, dear, will make it rain before the week is out, and save our kitchen garden from entire ruination, that is the party Susan will vote for. In the meantime, will you just step out and give me your opinion on the meat for dinner? I am fearing that it is very tough and I think that we had better change our butcher as well as our government. One evening, a week later, Anne walked down to the point, to see if she could get some fresh fish from Captain Jim, leaving Little Jem for the first time. It was quite a tragedy. 
Suppose he cried. Suppose Susan did not know just exactly what to do for him. Susan was calm and serene. I have had as much experience with him as you, Mrs. Doctor, dear, have I not? Yes, with him but not with other babies. Why, I looked after three pairs of twins, when I was a child, Susan. When they cried, I gave them peppermint or castor oil quite coolly. It's quite curious now to recall how lightly I took all those babies and their woes. Oh, well, if little Jem cries, I will just clap a hot water bag on his little stomach, said Susan. Not too hot, you know, said Anne anxiously. Oh, was it really wise to go? Do not you fret, Mrs. Doctor, dear. Susan is not the woman to burn a wee man. Bless him, he has no notion of crying. Anne tore herself away finally and enjoyed her walk to the point after all, through the long shadows of the sun setting. Captain Jim was not in the living room of the lighthouse, but another man was a handsome, middle-aged man, with a strong, clean-shaven chin, who was unknown to Anne. Nevertheless, when she sat down, he began to talk to her with all the assurance of an old acquaintance. There was nothing amiss in what he said or the way he said it but Anne rather resented such a cool taking for granted in a complete stranger. Her replies were frosty, and as few as decency required. Nothing daunted, her companion talked on for several minutes, then excused himself and went away. Anne could have sworn there was a twinkle in his eye and it annoyed her. Who was the creature? There was something vaguely familiar about him but she was certain she had never seen him before. Captain Jim who is that who just went out? She asked, as Captain Jim came in. Marshal Elliot, answered the captain. Marshal Elliot, cried Anne. Oh, Captain Jim it wasn't yes, it was his voice oh, Captain Jim, I didn't know him and I was quite insulting to him. Why didn't he tell me? He must have seen I didn't know him. He wouldn't say a word about it he'd just enjoy the joke. Don't worry over snubbing him he'll think it fun. Yes, Marshall's shaved off his beard at last and cut his hair. His party is in, you know. I didn't know him myself first time I saw him. He was up in Carter Flagg's store at the Glen the night after election day, along with a crowd of others, waiting for the news. About twelve the phone came through the liberals were in. Marshall just got up and walked out he didn't cheer or shout he left the others to do that and they nearly lifted the roof off Carter's store, I reckon. Of course, all the Tories were over in Raymond Russell's store. Not much cheering there. Marshall went straight down the street to the side door of Augustus Palmer's barber shop. Augustus was in bed asleep, but Marhall hammered on the door until he got up and come down, wanting to know what all the racket was about. Come into your shop and do the best job you ever did in your life, Gus, said Marshall. The liberals are in and you're going to barber a good grit before the sun rises. Gus was mad as hops partly because he'd been dragged out of bed, but more because he's a Tory. He vowed he wouldn't shave any man after twelve at night. You'll do what I want you to do, Sonny, said Marshall, or I'll just turn you over my knee and give you one of those spankings your mother forgot. He'd have done it, too, and Gus knew it for Marshall is as strong as an ox and Gus is only a midget of a man. So he gave in and towed Marshall into the shop and went to work. Now, says he, I'll barber you up, but if you say one word to me about the grits getting in while I'm doing it I'll cut your throat with this razor, says he. You wouldn't have thought mild little Gus could be so bloodthirsty, would you? Shows what party politics will do for a man. Marshall kept quiet and got his hair and beard disposed of and went home. When his old housekeeper heard him come upstairs she peeked out of her bedroom door to see whether twas him or the hired boy. And when she saw a strange man striding down the hall with a candle in his hand she screamed blue murder and fainted dead away. They had to send for the doctor before they could bring her to, and it was several days before she could look at Marshall without shaking all over. Captain Jim had no fish. He seldom went out in his boat that summer, and his long tramping expeditions were over. He spent a great deal of his time sitting by his seaward window, looking out over the gulf, with his swiftly widening head leaning on his hand. 
He sat there tonight for many silent minutes, keeping some tryst with the past which Anne would not disturb. Presently he pointed to the iris of the West. That's beautiful, isn't it, Mistress Blythe? But I wish you could have seen the sunrise this morning. It was a wonderful thing wonderful. I've seen all kinds of sunrises come over that gulf. I've been all over the world, Mistress Blythe, and take it all in all, I've never seen a finer sight than a summer sunrise over the gulf. A man can't pick his time for dying, Mistress Blythe just got to go when the great captain gives his sailing orders. But if I could I'd go out when the morning comes across that water. I've watched it many a time and thought what a thing it would be to pass out through that great white glory to whatever was waiting bayant, on a sea that ain't mapped out on any earthly chart. I think, Mistress Blythe, that I'd find lost Margaret there. Captain Jim had often talked to Anne of lost Margaret since he had told her the old story. His love for her trembled in every tone that love that had never grown faint or forgetful. Anyway, I hope when my time comes I'll go quick and easy. I don't think I'm a coward, Mistress Blythe I've looked an ugly death in the face more than once without blenching. But the thought of a lingering death does give me a queer, sick feeling of horror. Don't talk about leaving us, dear, dear Captain. Jim, pleaded Anne, in a choked voice, patting the old brown hand, once so strong, but now grown very feeble. What would we do without you? Captain Jim smiled beautifully. Oh, you'd get along nicely nicely but you wouldn't forget the old man altogether. Mistress Blythe no, I don't think you'll ever quite forget him. The race of Joseph always remembers one another. But it'll be a memory that won't hurt I like to think that my memory won't hurt my friends it'll always be kind of pleasant to them, I hope and believe. It won't be very long now before lost Margaret calls me, for the last time. I'll be all ready to answer. I just spoke of this because there's a little favor I want to ask you. Here's this poor old matey of mine. Captain Jim reached out a hand and poked the big, warm, velvety, golden ball on the sofa. The first mate uncoiled himself like a spring with a nice, throaty, comfortable sound. Half purr, half meow, stretched his paws in air, turned over and coiled himself up again. He'll miss me when I start on the viage. I can't bear to think of leaving the poor critter to starve, like he was left before. If anything happens to me will you give Mady a bite in a corner, Mistress Blythe? Indeed I will. Then that is all I had on my mind. Your little gem is to have the few curious things I picked up I've seen to that. And now I don't like to see tears in those pretty eyes, Mistress Blythe. I'll maybe hang on for quite a spell yet. I heard you reading a piece of poetry one day last winter one of Tennyson's pieces. I'd sorter like to hear it again, if you could recite it for me. Softly and clearly, while the sea wind blew in on them, Anne repeated the beautiful lines of Tennyson's wonderful swan song, crossing the bar. The old captain kept time gently with his sinewy hand. Yes, yes, Mistress Blythe, he said, when she had finished, that's it, that's it. He wasn't a sailor, you tell me I dunno how he could have put an old sailor's feelings into words like that, if he wasn't one. He didn't want any, sadness o' oh, ferules and neither do I, Mistress Blythe for all will be well with me and mine bay in the bar. Chapter 36 Beauty for Ashes Any news from Green Gables, Anne? Nothing very especial, replied Anne, folding up Marilla's letter. Jake Donnell has been there shingling the roof. He is a full-fledged carpenter now, so it seems he has had his own way in regard to the choice of a life work. You remember his mother wanted him to be a college professor. I shall never forget the day she came to the school and rated me for failing to call him street. Claire, does anyone ever call him that now? Evidently not. It seems that he has completely lived it down. Even his mother has succumbed. I always thought that a boy with Jake's chin and mouth would get his own way in the end. Diana writes me that Dora has a bow. Just think of it that child. Dora is 17, said Gilbert. Charlie Sloan and I were both mad about you when you were 17, Anne. Really, Gilbert, we must be getting on in years, said Anne, with a half-rueful smile, 
when children who were six when we thought ourselves grown up or old enough now to have beau. Doris is Ralph Andrews Jane's brother. I remember him as a little, round, fat, white-headed fellow who was always at the foot of his class. But I understand he is quite a fine-looking young man now. Dora will probably marry young. She's of the same type as Charlotte of the fourth. She'll never miss her first chance for fear she might not get another. Well, if she marries Ralph I hope he will be a little more up and coming than his brother Billy, mused Anne. For instance, said Gilbert, laughing, let us hope he will be able to propose on his own account. Anne, would you have married Billy if he had asked you himself, instead of getting Jane to do it for him? I might have. Anne went off into a shriek of laughter over the recollection of her first proposal. The shock of the whole thing might have hypnotized me into some such rash and foolish act. Let us be thankful he did it by proxy. I had a letter from George Moore yesterday, said Leslie, from the corner where she was reading. Oh, how is he? asked Anne interestedly, yet with an unreal feeling that she was inquiring about someone whom she did not know. He is well, but he finds it very hard to adapt himself to all the changes in his old home and friends. He is going to see again in the spring. It's in his blood, he says, and he longs for it. But he told me something that made me glad for him, poor fellow. Before he sailed on the four sisters he was engaged to a girl at home. He did not tell me anything about her in Montreal, because he said he supposed she would have forgotten him and married someone else long ago, and with him, you see, his engagement and love was still a thing of the present. It was pretty hard on him, but when he got home he found she had never married and still cared for him. They are to be married this fall. I'm going to ask him to bring her over here for a little trip. He says he wants to come and see the place where he lived so many years without knowing it. What a nice little romance, said Anne, whose love for the romantic was immortal. And to think, she added with a sigh of self-reproach, that if I had had my way George Moore would never have come up from the grave in which his identity was buried. How I did fight against Gilbert's suggestion. Well, I am punished. I shall never be able to have a different opinion from Gilbert's again. If I try to have, he will squelch me by casting George Moore's case up to me. As if even that would squelch a woman. Mocked Gilbert. At least do not become my echo, Anne. A little opposition gives spice to life. I do not want a wife like John Macklister's over the harbor. No matter what he says, she at once remarks in that drab, lifeless little voice of hers, that is very true, John, dear me. Anne and Leslie laughed. Anne's laughter was silver and Leslie's golden, and the combination of the two was as satisfactory as a perfect chord in music. Susan, coming in on the heels of the laughter, echoed it with a resounding sigh. Why, Susan, what is the matter? Asked Gilbert. There's nothing wrong with little Jem, is there, Susan? Cried Anne, starting up in alarm. No, no, calm yourself, Mrs. Doctor, dear. Something has happened, though. Dear me, everything has gone catawampus with me this week. I spoiled the bread, as you know too well and I scorched the doctor's best shirt bosom and I broke your big platter. And now, on the top of all this, comes word that my sister Matilda has broken her leg and wants me to go and stay with her for a spell. Oh, I'm very sorry sorry that your sister has met with such an accident, I mean, exclaimed Anne. Ah, well, man was made to mourn, Mrs. Doctor, dear. That sounds as if it ought to be in the Bible but they tell me a person named Burns wrote it. And there is no doubt that we are born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. As for Matilda, I do not know what to think of her. None of our family ever broke their legs before. But whatever she has done she is still my sister, and I feel that it is my duty to go and wait on her. If you can spare me for a few weeks, Mrs. Doctor, dear. Of course, Susan, of course. I can get someone to help me while you are gone. If you cannot I will not go, Mrs. Doctor, dear, Matilda's leg to the contrary notwithstanding. I will not have you worried, and that blessed child upset in consequence, for any number of legs. Oh, you must go to your sister at once, 
Susan. I can get a girl from the cove, who will do for a time. Anne, will you let me come and stay with you while Susan is away? exclaimed Leslie. Do, I'd love to and it would be an act of charity in your part. I'm so horribly lonely over there in that big barn of a house. There's so little to do and at night I'm worse than lonely I'm frightened and nervous in spite of locked doors. There was a tramp around two days ago. Anne joyfully agreed and next day Leslie was installed as an inmate of the Little House of Dreams. Miss Cornelia warmly approved of the arrangement. It seems providential, she told Anne in confidence. I'm sorry for Matilda Clo, but since she had to break her leg it couldn't have happened at a better time. Leslie will be here while Owen Ford is in Four Winds, and those old cats up at the Glen won't get the chance to meow, as they would if she was living over there alone and Owen going to see her. They are doing enough of it as it is, because she doesn't put on mourning. I said to one of them, if you mean she should put on mourning for George Moore, it seems to me more like his resurrection than his funeral, and if it's Dick you mean, I confess underscore I underscore can't see the propriety of going into weeds for a man who died 13 years ago and good riddance then. And when old Louisa Baldwin remarked to me that she thought it very strange that Leslie should never have suspected it wasn't her own husband underscore I underscore said, you never suspected it wasn't Dick Moore, and you were next door neighbor to him all his life. And by nature you're ten times as suspicious as Leslie. But you can't stop some people's tongues, Anne, dearie, and I'm real thankful Leslie will be under your roof while Owen is courting her. Owen Ford came to the little house one August evening when Leslie and Anne were absorbed in worshipping the baby. He paused at the open door of the living room, unseen by the two within, gazing with greedy eyes at the beautiful picture. Leslie sat on the floor with the baby in her lap, making ecstatic dabs at his fat little hands as he fluttered them in the air. Oh, you dear, beautiful, beloved baby, she mumbled, catching one wee hand and covering it with kisses. Isn't him ze darlingest itty sing, crooned Anne, hanging over the arm of her chair adoringly. Dem itty wee pads are ze very tweets handies in ze whole big world, isn't they, you darling itty man. Anne, in the months before Little Jem's coming, had pored diligently over several wise volumes, and pinned her faith to one in especial, Sir Oracle on the care and training of children. Sir Oracle implored parents by all they held sacred never to talk baby talk, to their children. Infants should invariably be addressed in classical language from the moment of their birth. So should they learn to speak English undefiled from their earliest utterance. How, demanded Sir Oracle, can a mother reasonably expect her child to learn correct speech, when she continually accustoms its impressionable gray matter to such absurd expressions and distortions of our noble tongue as thoughtless mothers inflict every day on the helpless creatures committed to their care. Can a child who is constantly called, tweet itty wee singy, ever attain to any proper conception of his own being and possibilities and destiny? Anne was vastly impressed with this, and informed Gilbert that she meant to make it an inflexible rule never, under any circumstances, to talk baby talk, to her children. Gilbert agreed with her, and they made a solemn compact on the subject a compact which Anne shamelessly violated the very first moment little Jem was laid in her arms. Oh, the darling itty we sing, she had exclaimed, and she had continued to violate it ever since. When Gilbert teased her she laughed Sir Oracle to scorn. He never had any children of his own, Gilbert I am positive he hadn't or he would never have written such rubbish. You just can't help talking baby talk to a baby. It comes natural and it's right. It would be inhuman to talk to those tiny, soft, velvety little creatures as we do to great big boys and girls. Babies want love and cuddling and all the sweet baby talk they can get, and little Jem is going to have it, bless his dear itty heartums. But you're the worst I ever heard, Anne protested Gilbert, who, not being a mother but only a father, was not wholly convinced yet that Sir Oracle was wrong. I never heard anything like the way you talked to that child. Very likely you never did. Go away, go away. Didn't I bring up three pairs of Hammond twins before I was eleven? You and Sir Oracle are nothing but cold-blooded theorists. Gilbert, just look at him. 
He's smiling at me he knows what we're talking about. And who dest agwees with Evie word muzzer says. Don't do, angel lover. Gilbert put his arm about them. Oh you mothers, he said. You mothers. God knew what he was about when he made you. So little Jem was talked to and loved and cuddled, and he throve as became a child of the house of dreams. Leslie was quite as foolish over him as Anne was. When their work was done and Gilbert was out of the way, they gave themselves over to shameless orgies of love-making and ecstasies of adoration, such as that in which Owen Ford had surprised them. Leslie was the first to become aware of him. Even in the twilight Anne could see the sudden whiteness that swept over her beautiful face, blotting out the crimson of lip and cheeks. Owen came forward, eagerly, blind for a moment to Anne. Leslie, he said, holding out his hand. It was the first time he had ever called her by her name, but the hand Leslie gave him was cold, and she was very quiet all the evening, while Anne and Gilbert and Owen laughed and talked together. Before his call ended she excused herself and went upstairs. Owen's gay spirits flagged and he went away soon after with a downcast air. Gilbert looked at Anne. Anne, what are you up to? There's something going on that I don't understand. The whole air here tonight has been charged with electricity. Leslie sits like the muse of tragedy. Owen Ford jokes and laughs on the surface, and watches Leslie with the eyes of his soul. You seem all the time to be bursting with some suppressed excitement. Own up. What secret have you been keeping from your deceived husband? Don't be a goose, Gilbert, was Anne's conjugal reply. As for Leslie, she is absurd and I'm going up to tell her so. Anne found Leslie at the dormer window of her room. The little place was filled with the rhythmic thunder of the sea. Leslie sat with locked hands in the misty moonshine a beautiful, accusing presence. Anne, she said in a low, reproachful voice, did you know Owen Ford was coming to Four Winds? I did, said Anne brazenly. Oh, you should have told me, Anne, Leslie cried passionately. If I had known I would have gone away I wouldn't have stayed here to meet him. You should have told me. It wasn't fair of you, Anne oh, it wasn't fair. Leslie's lips were trembling and her whole form was tense with emotion. But Anne laughed heartlessly. She bent over and kissed Leslie's upturned reproachful face. Leslie, you are an adorable goose. Owen Ford didn't rush from the Pacific to the Atlantic from a burning desire to see M.E. Neither do I believe that he was inspired by any wild and frenzied passion for Miss Cornelia. Take off your tragic airs, my dear friend, and fold them up and put them away in lavender. You'll never need them again. There are some people who can see through a grindstone when there is a hole in it, even if you cannot. I am not a prophetess, but I shall venture on a prediction. The bitterness of life is over for you. After this you are going to have the joys and hopes and I dare say the sorrows, too of a happy woman. The omen of the shadow of Venus did come true for you, Leslie. The year in which you saw it brought your life's best gift for you your love for Owen Ford. Now. Go right to bed and have a good sleep. Leslie obeyed orders in so far that she went to bed, but it may be questioned if she slept much. I do not think she dared to dream wakingly. Life had been so hard for this poor Leslie, the path on which she had had to walk had been so straight, that she could not whisper to her own heart the hopes that might wait on the future. But she watched the great revolving light bestarring the short hours of the summer night, and her eyes grew soft and bright and young once more. Nor, when Owen Ford came next day, to ask her to go with him to the shore, did she say him nay. Chapter 37 Miss Cornelia makes a startling announcement. Miss Cornelia sailed down to the little house one drowsy afternoon, when the gulf was the faint, bleached blue of the August seas, and the orange lilies at the gate of Anne's garden held up their imperial cups to be filled with the molten gold of August sunshine. Not that Miss Cornelia concerned herself with painted oceans or sun-thirsty lilies. She sat in her favorite rocker in unusual idleness. She sewed not, neither did she spin. Nor did she say a single derogatory word concerning any portion of mankind. In short, Miss Cornelia's conversation was singularly devoid of spice that day, and Gilbert, who had stayed home to listen to her, instead of going a-fishing, 
as he had intended, felt himself aggrieved. What had come over Miss Cornelia? She did not look cast down or worried. On the contrary, there was a certain air of nervous exultation about her. Where is Leslie? She asked not as if it mattered much either. Owen and she went raspberrying in the woods back of her farm, answered Anne. They won't be back before supper time if then. They don't seem to have any idea that there is such a thing as a clock, said Gilbert. I can't get to the bottom of that affair. I'm certain you women pulled strings. But Anne, undutiful wife, won't tell me. Will you, Miss Cornelia? No, I shall not. But, said Miss Cornelia, with the air of one determined to take the plunge and have it over, I will tell you something else. I came today on purpose to tell it. I am going to be married. Anne and Gilbert were silent. If Miss Cornelia had announced her intention of going out to the channel and drowning herself the thing might have been believable. This was not. So they waited. Of course Miss Cornelia had made a mistake. Well, you both look sort of kerplumexed, said Miss Cornelia, with a twinkle in her eyes. Now that the awkward moment of revelation was over, Miss Cornelia was her own woman again. Do you think I'm too young and inexperienced for matrimony? You know it is rather staggering, said Gilbert, trying to gather his wits together. I've heard you say a score of times that you wouldn't marry the best man in the world. I'm not going to marry the best man in the world, retorted Miss Cornelia. Marshall Elliot is a long way from being the best. Are you going to marry Marshall Elliot? exclaimed Anne, recovering her power of speech under this second shock. Yes, I could have had him any time these twenty years if I'd lifted my finger. But do you suppose I was going to walk into church beside a perambulating haystack like that? I am sure we are very glad and we wish you all possible happiness, said Anne, very flatly and inadequately, as she felt. She was not prepared for such an occasion. She had never imagined herself offering betrothal felicitations to Miss Cornelia. Thanks, I knew you would said Miss Cornelia. You are the first of my friends to know it. We shall be so sorry to lose you, though, dear Miss Cornelia, said Anne, beginning to be a little sad and sentimental. Oh, you won't lose me, said Miss Cornelia unsentimentally. You don't suppose I would live over harbor with all those Macklisters and Elliots and Crawfords, do you? From the conceit of the Elliots, the pride of the Macklisters and the vain glory of the Crawfords, good Lord deliver us. Marshall is coming to live at my place. I'm sick and tired of hired men. That Jim Hastings of got this summer is positively the worst of the species. He would drive anyone to getting married. What do you think? He upset the churn yesterday and spilled a big churning of cream over the yard. And not one whit concerned about it was he just gave a foolish laugh and said cream was good for the land. Wasn't that like a man? I told him I wasn't in the habit of fertilizing my backyard with cream. Well, I wish you all manner of happiness too, Miss Cornelia, said Gilbert, solemnly, but, he added, unable to resist the temptation to tease Miss Cornelia, despite Anne's imploring eyes, I fear your day of independence is done. As you know, Marshall Elliot is a very determined man. I like a man who can stick to a thing, retorted Miss Cornelia. Amos Grant, who used to be after me long ago, couldn't. You never saw such a weather vane. He jumped into the pond to drown himself once and then changed his mind and swum out again. Wasn't that like a man? Marshall would have stuck to it and drowned. And he has a bit of a temper, they tell me, persisted Gilbert. He wouldn't be an Elliot if he hadn't. I'm thankful he has. It will be real fun to make him mad. And you can generally do something with a temporary man when it comes to repenting time. But you can't do anything with a man who just keeps placid and aggravating. You know he's a grit, Miss Cornelia. Yes, he is, admitted Miss Cornelia rather sadly. And of course there is no hope of making a conservative of him but at least he is a Presbyterian. So I suppose I shall have to be satisfied with that. Would you marry him if he were a Methodist, Miss Cornelia? No, I would not. Politics is for this world, but religion is for both. And you may be a 
Relict, after all, Miss Cornelia. Not I. Marshall will live me out. The Elliots are long lived, and the Bryants are not. When are you to be married? Asked Anne. In about a month's time. My wedding dress is to be navy blue silk. And I want to ask you, Anne, dearie, if you think it would be all right to wear a veil with a navy blue dress. I've always thought I'd like to wear a veil if I ever got married. Marshall says to have it if I want to. Isn't that like a man? Why shouldn't you wear it if you want to? Asked Anne. Well, one doesn't want to be different from other people, said Miss Cornelia, who is not noticeably like anyone else on the face of the earth. As I say, I do fancy a veil. But maybe it shouldn't be worn with any dress but a white one. Please tell me, Anne, dearie, what you really think. I'll go by your advice. I don't think veils are usually worn with any but white dresses, admitted Anne, but that is merely a convention, and I am like Mr. Elliot, Miss Cornelia. I don't see any good reason why you shouldn't have a veil if you want one. But Miss Cornelia, who made her calls in calico wrappers, shook her head. If it isn't the proper thing I won't wear it, she said, with a sigh of regret for a lost dream. Since you are determined to be married, Miss Cornelia, said Gilbert solemnly, I shall give you the excellent rules for the management of a husband which my grandmother gave my mother when she married my father. Well, I reckon I can manage Marshall Elliot, said Miss Cornelia placidly. But let us hear your rules. The first one is, catch him. He's caught. Go on. The second one is, feed him well. With enough pie. What next? The third and fourth are keep your eye on him. I believe you, said Miss Cornelia emphatically. Chapter 38. Red Roses. The garden of the little house was a haunt beloved of bees and reddened by late roses that August. The little house folk lived much in it, and were given to taking picnic suppers in the grassy corner beyond the brook and sitting about in it through the twilights when great night moths sailed athwart the velvet gloom. One evening Owen Ford found Leslie alone in it. Anne and Gilbert were away, and Susan, who was expected back that night, had not yet returned. The northern sky was amber and pale green over the fir tops. The air was cool, for August was nearing September, and Leslie wore a crimson scarf over her white dress. Together they wandered through the little, friendly, flower-crowded paths in silence. Owen must go soon. His holiday was nearly over. Leslie found her heart beating wildly. She knew that this beloved garden was to be the scene of the binding words that must seal their as yet unworded understanding. Some evenings a strange odor blows down the air of this garden, like a phantom perfume, said Owen. I have never been able to discover from just what flower it comes. It is elusive and haunting and wonderfully sweet. I like to fancy it is the soul of Grandmother Selwyn passing on a little visit to the old spot she loved so well. There should be a lot of friendly ghosts about this little old house. I have lived under its roof only a month, said Leslie, but I love it as I never loved the house over there where I have lived all my life. This house was builded and consecrated by love, said Owen. Such houses, must exert an influence over those who live in them. And this garden it is over sixty years old and the history of a thousand hopes and joys is written in its blossoms. Some of those flowers were actually set out by the Schulmaster's bride, and she has been dead for thirty years. Yet they bloom on every summer. Look at those red roses, Leslie how they queen it over everything else. I love the red roses, said Leslie. Anne likes the pink ones best, and Gilbert likes the white. But I want the crimson ones. They satisfy some craving in me as no other flower does. These roses are very late they bloom after all the others have gone and they hold all the warmth and soul of the summer come to fruition, said Owen, plucking some of the glowing, half-opened buds. The rose is the flower of love the world has acclaimed it so for centuries. The pink roses are love hopeful and expectant the white roses are love dead or forsaken but the red roses ah, Leslie, what are the red roses? Love triumphant, said Leslie in a low voice. Yes love triumphant and perfect. Leslie, you know you understand. I have loved you from the first. 
And I know you love me I don't need to ask you. But I want to hear you say it my darling my darling. Leslie said something in a very low and tremulous voice. Their hands and lips met. It was life's supreme moment for them and as they stood there in the old garden, with its many years of love and delight and sorrow and glory, he crowned her shining hair with the red, red rose of a love triumphant. Anne and Gilbert returned presently, accompanied by Captain Jim. Anne lighted a few sticks of driftwood in the fireplace, for love of the pixie flames, and they sat around it for an hour of good fellowship. When I sit looking at a driftwood fire it's easy to believe I'm young again, said Captain Jim. Can you read futures in the fire, Captain Jim? asked Owen. Captain Jim looked at them all affectionately and then back again at Leslie's vivid face and glowing eyes. I don't need the fire to read your futures, he said. I see happiness for all of you all of you for Leslie and Misterford and the doctor here and Mistress Blythe and little Jem and children that ain't born yet but will be. Happiness for you all though, mind you, I reckon you'll have your troubles and worries and sorrows, too. They're bound to come and no house, whether it's a palace or a little house of dreams, can bar em out. But they won't get the better of you if you face em together with love and trust. You can weather any storm with them too for compass and pilot. The old man rose suddenly and placed one hand on Leslie's head and one on Anne's. Two good, sweet women, he said. True and faithful and to be depended on. Your husbands will have honor in the gates because of you your children will rise up and call you blessed in the years to come. There was a strange solemnity about the little scene. Anne and Leslie bowed as those receiving a benediction. Gilbert suddenly brushed his hand over his eyes. Owen Ford was rapt as one who can see visions. All were silent for a space. The little house of dreams added another poignant and unforgettable moment to its store of memories. I must be going now, said Captain Jim slowly at last. He took up his hat and looked lingeringly about the room. Good night, all of you, he said, as he went out. Anne. Pierced by the unusual wistfulness of his farewell, ran to the door after him. Come back soon, Captain Jim, she called, as he passed through the little gate hung between the firs. I, I, he called cheerily back to her. But Captain Jim had sat by the old fireside of the House of Dreams for the last time. Anne went slowly back to the others. It's so, so pitiful to think of him going all alone down to that lonely point, she said. And there is no one to welcome him there. Captain Jim is such good company for others that one can't imagine him being anything but good company for himself, said Owen. But he must often be lonely. There was a touch of the seer about him tonight he spoke as one to whom it had been given to speak. Well, I must be going, too. Anne and Gilbert discreetly melted away. But when Owen had gone Anne returned, to find Leslie standing by the hearth. Oh. Leslie I know and I'm so glad, dear, she said, putting her arms about her. Anne, my happiness frightens me, whispered Leslie. It seems too great to be real I'm afraid to speak of it to think of it. It seems to me that it must just be another dream of this house of dreams and it will vanish when I leave here. Well, you are not going to leave here until Owen takes you. You are going to stay with me until the times comes. Do you think I'd let you go over to that lonely, sad place again? Thank you, dear. I meant to ask you if I might stay with you. I didn't want to go back there. It would seem like going back into the chill and dreariness of the old life again. Anne, Anne, what a friend you've been to me. A good, sweet woman true and faithful and to be depended on, Captain Jim summed you up. He said, women, not, woman, smiled Anne. Perhaps Captain Jim sees us both through the rose-colored spectacles of his love for us. But we can try to live up to his belief in us, at least. Do you remember, Anne, said Leslie slowly, that I once said that night we met on the shore that I hated my good looks. I did then. It always seemed to me that if I had been homely Dick would never have thought of me. I hated my beauty because it had attracted him, but now oh, I'm glad that I have it. It's all I have to offer Owen, his artist soul delights in it. I feel as if I do not come to him quite empty-handed. Owen loves your beauty, Leslie. 
Who would not? But it's foolish of you to say or think that that is all you bring him. He will tell you that I needn't. And now I must lock up. I expected Susan back tonight, but she has not come. Oh, yes, here I am, Mrs. Doctor, dear, said Susan, entering unexpectedly from the kitchen, and puffing like a hen drawing rails at that. It's quite a walk from the glen down here. I'm glad to see you back, Susan. How is your sister? She is able to sit up, but of course she cannot walk yet. However, she is very well able to get on without me now, for her daughter has come home for her vacation. And I am thankful to be back, Mrs. Doctor, dear. Matilda's leg was broken and no mistake, but her tongue was not. She would talk the legs off an iron pot, that she would, Mrs. Doctor, dear, though I grieve to say it of my own sister. She was always a great talker and yet she was the first of our family to get married. She really did not care much about marrying James Clo, but she could not bear to disoblige him. Not but what James is a good man the only fault I have to find with him is that he always starts in to say grace with such an unearthly groan, Mrs. Doctor, dear. It always frightens my appetite clear away. And speaking of getting married, Mrs. Doctor, dear, is it true that Cornelia Bryant is going to be married to Marshall Elliott? Yes, quite true, Susan. Well, Mrs. Doctor, dear, it does not seem to me fair. Here is me, who never said a word against the men, and I cannot get married nohow. And there is Cornelia Bryant, who is never done abusing them, and all she has to do is to reach out her hand and pick one up, as it were. It is a very strange world, Mrs. Doctor, dear. There's another world, you know, Susan. Yes, said Susan with a heavy sigh, but, Mrs. Doctor, dear, there is neither marrying nor giving in marriage there. Chapter 39. Captain Jim Crosses the Bar. One day in late September Owen Ford's book came at last. Captain Jim had gone faithfully to the Glen Post Office every day for a month, expecting it. This day he had not gone, and Leslie brought his copy home with hers and Anne's. We'll take it down to him this evening, said Anne, excited as a schoolgirl. The long walk to the point on that clear, beguiling evening along the Red Harbor Road was very pleasant. Then the sun dropped down behind the western hills into some valley that must have been full of lost sunsets, and at the same instant the big light flashed out on the white tower of the point. Captain Jim is never late by the fraction of a second, said Leslie. Neither Anne nor Leslie ever forgot Captain Jim's face when they gave him the book his book, transfigured and glorified. The cheeks that had been blanched of late suddenly flamed with the color of boyhood, his eyes glowed with all the fire of youth, but his hands trembled as he opened it. It was called simply the Life Book of Captain Jim, and on the title page the names of Owen Ford and James Boyd were printed as collaborators. The frontispiece was a photograph of Captain Jim himself, standing at the door of the lighthouse, looking across the gulf. Owen Ford had, snapped, him one day while the book was being written. Captain Jim had known this, but he had not known that the picture was to be in the book. Just think of it, he said, the old sailor right there in a real printed book. This is the proudest day of my life. I'm like to bust, girls. There'll be no sleep for me tonight. I'll read my book clean through before sun up. We'll go right away and leave you free to begin it, said Anne. Captain Jim had been handling the book in a kind of reverent rapture. Now he decidedly closed it and laid it aside. No, no, you're not going away before you take a cup of tea with the old man, he protested. I couldn't hear to that could you, matey. The life book will keep, I reckon. I've waited for it this many a year. I can wait a little longer while I'm enjoying my friends. Captain Jim moved about getting his kettle on to boil and setting out his bread and butter. Despite his excitement he did not move with his old briskness. His movements were slow and halting. But the girls did not offer to help him. They knew it would hurt his feelings. You just picked the right evening to visit me, he said, producing a cake from his cupboard. Little Joe's mother sent me down a big basket full of cakes and pies today. A blessing on all good cooks, says I. 
Look at this pretty cake. All frosting and nuts. Taint often I can entertain in such style. Set in. Girls, set in. We'll, talk a cup o' kindness yet for auld lang syne. The girls, set in, right merrily. The tea was up to Captain Jim's best brewing. Little Joe's mother's cake was the last word in cakes. Captain Jim was the prince of gracious hosts, never even permitting his eyes to wander to the corner where the life book lay, in all its bravery of green and gold. But when his door finally closed behind Anne and Leslie they knew that he went straight to it. And as they walked home they pictured the delight of the old man poring over the printed pages wherein his own life was portrayed with all the charm and color of reality itself. I wonder how he will like the ending the ending I suggested, said Leslie. She was never to know. Early the next morning Anne awakened to find Gilbert bending over her, fully dressed, and with an expression of anxiety on his face. Are you called out? She asked drowsily. No. Anne. I'm afraid there's something wrong at the point. It's an hour after sunrise now, and the light is still burning. You know it has always been a matter of pride with Captain Jim to start the light the moment the sun sets, and put it out the moment it rises. Anne sat up in dismay. Through her window she saw the light blinking palely against the blue skies of dawn. Perhaps he has fallen asleep over his life book, she said anxiously or become so absorbed in it that he has forgotten the light. Gilbert shook his head. That wouldn't be like Captain Jim. Anyway, I'm going down to see. Wait a minute and I'll go with you, exclaimed Anne. Oh, yes, I must little Jem will sleep for an hour yet, and I'll call Susan. You may need a woman's help if Captain Jim is ill. It was an exquisite morning, full of tints and sounds at once ripe and delicate. The harbor was sparkling and dimpling like a girl, white gulls were soaring over the dunes, beyond the bar was a shining, wonderful sea. The long fields by the shore were dewy and fresh in that first fine, purely tinted light. The wind came dancing and whistling up the channel to replace the beautiful silence with a music more beautiful still. Had it not been for the baleful star on the white tower that early walk would have been a delight to Anne and Gilbert. But they went softly with fear. Their knock was not responded to. Gilbert opened the door and they went in. The old room was very quiet. On the table were the remnants of the little evening feast. The lamp still burned on the corner stand. The first mate was asleep in a square of sunshine by the sofa. Captain Jim lay on the sofa, with his hands clasped over the life book, open at the last page, lying on his breast. His eyes were closed and on his face was a look of the most perfect peace and happiness the look of one who has long sought and found at last. He is asleep, whispered Anne tremulously. Gilbert went to the sofa and bent over him for a few moments. Then he straightened up. Yes, he sleeps well, he added quietly. Anne, Captain Jim has crossed the bar. They could not know precisely at what hour he had died, but Anne always believed that he had had his wish and went out when the morning came across the gulf. Out on that shining tide his spirit drifted, over the sunrise sea of pearl and silver, to the haven where lost Margaret waited, beyond the storms and calms. Chapter 40. Farewell to the House of Dreams. Captain Jim was buried in the little over harbor graveyard, very near to the spot where the wee white lady slept. His relatives put up a very expensive, very ugly, monument, a monument at which he would have poked sly fun had he seen it in life. But his real monument was in the hearts of those who knew him, and in the book that was to live for generations. Leslie mourned that Captain Jim had not lived to see the amazing success of it. How he would have delighted in the reviews they are almost all so kindly. And to have seen his life book heading the lists of the best sellers oh, if he could just have lived to see it, Anne. But Anne, despite her grief, was wiser. It was the book itself he cared for, Leslie not what might be said of it and he had it. He had read it all through. That last night must have been one of the greatest happiness for him with the quick, painless ending he had hoped for in the morning. I am glad for Owen's sake and yours that the book is such a success but Captain Jim was satisfied I know. The lighthouse star still kept a nightly vigil, a substitute keeper had been sent to the point 
until such time as an all-wise government could decide which of many applicants was best fitted for the place or had the strongest pull. The first mate was at home in the little house, beloved by Anne and Gilbert and Leslie, and tolerated by a Susan who had small liking for cats. I can put up with him for the sake of Captain Jim, Mrs. Doctor, dear, for I like the old man. And I will see that he gets bite and sup, and every mouse the traps account for. But do not ask me to do more than that, Mrs. Doctor, dear. Cats is cats, and take my word for it, they will never be anything else. And at least, Mrs. Doctor, dear, do keep him away from the blessed wee man. Picture to yourself how awful it would be if he was to suck the darling's breath. That might be fitly called a catastrophe, said Gilbert. Oh, you may laugh, doctor, dear, but it would be no laughing matter. Cats never suck babies' breaths, said Gilbert. That is only an old superstition, Susan. Oh, well, it may be a superstition or it may not, doctor, dear. All that I know is, it has happened. My sister's husband's nephew's wife's cat sucked their baby's breath, and the poor innocent was all but gone when they found it. And superstition or not, if I find that yellow beast lurking near our baby I will whack him with the poker, Mrs. Doctor, dear. Mr. and Mrs. Marshall Elliot were living comfortably and harmoniously in the greenhouse. Leslie was busy with sewing, for she and Owen were to be married at Christmas. Anne wondered what she would do when Leslie was gone. Changes come all the time. Just as soon as things get really nice they change, she said with a sigh. The old Morgan place up at the Glen is for sale, said Gilbert, apropos of nothing in especial. Is it? asked Anne indifferently. Yes. Now that Mr. Morgan has gone, Mrs. Morgan wants to go to live with her children in Vancouver. She will sell cheaply. For a big place like that in a small village like the Glen will not be very easy to dispose of. Well, it's certainly a beautiful place, so it is likely she will find a purchaser, said Anne, absently, wondering whether she should hemstitch or feather stitch little gems, short, dresses. He was to be shortened the next week, and Anne felt ready to cry at the thought of it. Suppose we buy it, Anne, remarked Gilbert quietly. Anne dropped her sewing and stared at him. You're not in earnest, Gilbert. Indeed I am, dear. And leave this darling spot our house of dreams. Said Anne incredulously. Oh, Gilbert, it's it's unthinkable. Listen patiently to me, dear. I know just how you feel about it. I feel the same. But we've always known we would have to move someday. Oh, but not so soon, Gilbert not just yet. We may never get such a chance again. If we don't buy the Morgan place someone else will and there is no other house in the Glen we would care to have, and no other really good site on which to build. This little house as well, it is and has been what no other house can ever be to us. I admit, but you know it is out of the way down here for a doctor. We have felt the inconvenience, though we've made the best of it. And it's a tight fit for us now. Perhaps, in a few years, when Jem wants a room of his own, it will be entirely too small. Oh, I know I know, said Anne, tears filling her eyes. I know all that can be said against it, but I love it so and it's so beautiful here. You would find it very lonely here after Leslie goes and Captain Jim has gone too. The Morgan place is beautiful, and in time we would love it. You know you have always admired it, Anne. Oh, yes. But but this has all seemed to come up so suddenly, Gilbert. I'm dizzy. Ten minutes ago I had no thought of leaving this dear spot. I was planning what I meant to do for it in the spring what I meant to do in the garden. And if we leave this place who will get it? It is out of the way, so it's likely some poor, shiftless, wandering family will rent it and overrun it and oh, that would be desecration. It would hurt me horribly. I know. But we cannot sacrifice our own interests to such considerations, Anne girl. The Morgan place will suit us in every essential particular we really can't afford to miss such a chance. Think of that big lawn with those magnificent old trees, and of that splendid hardwood grove behind it twelve acres of it. What a play place for our children. There's a fine orchard, 
too, and you've always admired that high brick wall around the garden with the door in it you've thought it was so like a storybook garden. And there is almost as fine a view of the harbor and the dunes from the Morgan Place as from here. You can't see the lighthouse star from it. Yes, you can see it from the attic window. There's another advantage. Anne girl you love big garrets. There's no brook in the garden. Well, no, but there is one running through the maple grove into the glen pond. And the pond itself isn't far away. You'll be able to fancy you have your own lake of shining waters again. Well, don't say anything more about it just now, Gilbert. Give me time to think to get used to the idea. All right. There is no great hurry, of course. Only if we decide to buy, it would be well to be moved in and settled before winter. Gilbert went out, and Anne put away little Jem's short dresses with trembling hands. She could not sew any more that day. With tear-wet eyes she wandered over the little domain where she had reigned so happy a queen. The Morgan Place was all that Gilbert claimed. The grounds were beautiful, the house old enough to have dignity and repose and traditions, and new enough to be comfortable and up-to-date. Anne had always admired it, but admiring is not loving, and she loved this house of dreams so much. She loved everything about it the garden she had tended and which so many women had tended before her the gleam and sparkle of the little brook that crept so roguishly across the corner the gate between the creaking fir trees the old red sandstone step the stately Lombardies the two tiny quaint glass cupboards over the chimney piece in the living room the crooked pantry door in the kitchen the two funny dormer windows upstairs the little jog in the staircase why, these things were a part of her. How could she leave them? And how this little house, consecrated aforetime by love and joy, had been re-consecrated for her by her happiness and sorrow. Here she had spent her bridal moon, here we Joyce had lived her one brief day, here the sweetness of motherhood had come again with little Jem, here she had heard the exquisite music of her baby's cooing laughter, here beloved friends had sat by her fireside. Joy and grief, birth and death, had made sacred forever this little house of dreams. And now she must leave it. She knew that, even while she had contended against the idea to Gilbert. The little house was outgrown. Gilbert's interests made the change necessary. His work, successful though it had been, was hampered by his location. Anne realized that the end of their life in this dear place drew nigh, and that she must face the fact bravely. But how her heart ached. It will be just like tearing something out of my life, she sobbed. And oh, if I could hope that some nice folk would come here in our place or even that it would be left vacant. That itself would be better than having it overrun with some horde who know nothing of the geography of dreamland, and nothing of the history that has given this house its soul and its identity. And if such a tribe come here the place will go to rack and ruin in no time an old place goes down so quickly if it is not carefully attended to. They'll tear up my garden and let the Lombardies get ragged and the paling will come to look like a mouth with half the teeth missing and the roof will leak and the plaster fall and they'll stuff pillows and rags in broken window panes and everything will be out at elbows. Anne's imagination pictured forth so vividly the coming degeneration of her dear little house that it hurt her as severely as if it had already been an accomplished fact. She sat down on the stairs and had a long, bitter cry. Susan found her there and inquired with much concern what the trouble was. You have not quarreled with the doctor, have you now, Mrs. Doctor, dear? But if you have, do not worry. It is a thing quite likely to happen to married couples, I am told, although I have had no experience that way myself. He will be sorry, and you can soon make it up. No, no, Susan, we haven't quarreled. It's only Gilbert is going to buy the Morgan place, and we'll have to go and live at the Glen. And it will break my heart. Susan did not enter into Anne's feelings at all. She was, indeed, quite rejoiced over the prospect of living at the Glen. Her one grievance against her place in the little house was its lonesome location. Why, Mrs. Doctor, dear, it will be splendid. The Morgan house is such a fine, big one. I hate big houses, sobbed Anne. Oh, well, you will not hate them by the time you have half a dozen children, remarked Susan calmly. And this house is too small already for us. 
We have no spare room. Since Mrs. Moore is here, and that pantry is the most aggravating place I ever tried to work in. There is a corner every way you turn. Besides, it is out of the world down here. There is really nothing at all but scenery. Out of your world perhaps, Susan but not out of mine, said Anne with a faint smile. I do not quite understand you, Mrs. Doctor, dear, but of course I am not well educated. But if Dr. Bleed buys the Morgan place he will make no mistake and that you may tie to. They have water in it, and the pantries and closets are beautiful, and there is not another such cellar in P. E. Island, so I have been told. Why, the cellar here, Mrs. Doctor, dear, has been a heartbreak to me, as well you know. Oh, go away, Susan, go away, said Anne forlornly. Cellars and pantries and closets don't make a home. Why don't you weep with those who weep? Well, I never was much hand for weeping, Mrs. Doctor, dear. I would rather fall to and cheer people up than weep with them. Now, do not you cry and spoil your pretty eyes. This house is very well and has served your turn, but it is high time you had a better. Susan's point of view seemed to be that of most people. Leslie was the only one who sympathized understandingly with Anne. She had a good cry, too, when she heard the news. Then they both dried their tears and went to work at the preparations for moving. Since we must go let us go as soon as we can and have it over, said poor Anne with bitter resignation. You know you will like that lovely old place at the Glen after you have lived in it long enough to have dear memories woven about it, said Leslie. Friends will come there, as they have come here happiness will glorify it for you. Now, it's just a house to you but the years will make it a home. Anne and Leslie had another cry the next week when they shortened Little Jem. Anne felt the tragedy of it until evening when in his long nighty she found her own dear baby again. But it will be rompers next and then trousers and in no time he will be grown up, she sighed. Well, you would not want him to stay a baby always, Mrs. Doctor, dear, would you? Said Susan. Bless his innocent heart. He looks too sweet for anything in his little short dresses with his dear feet sticking out. And think of the save in the ironing, Mrs. Doctor, dear. Anne, I have just had a letter from Owen, said Leslie, entering with a bright face. And, oh, I have such good news. He writes me that he is going to buy this place from the church trustees and keep it to spend our summer vacations in. Anne, are you not glad? Oh, Leslie, glad, isn't the word for it. It seems almost too good to be true. I shan't feel half so badly now that I know this dear spot will never be desecrated by a vandal tribe, or left to tumble down in decay. Why, it's lovely. It's lovely. One October morning Anne wakened to the realization that she had slept for the last time under the roof of her little house. The day was too busy to indulge regret and when evening came the house was stripped and bare. Anne and Gilbert were alone in it to say farewell. Leslie and Susan and Little Jem had gone to the Glen with the last load of furniture. The sunset light streamed in through the curtainless windows. It has all such a heartbroken, reproachful look, hasn't it? Said Anne. Oh, I shall be so homesick at the Glen tonight. We have been very happy here, haven't we, Anne girl? Said Gilbert, his voice full of feeling. Anne choked, unable to answer. Gilbert waited for her at the fir tree gate, while she went over the house and said farewell to every room. She was going away, but the old house would still be there, looking seaward through its quaint windows. The autumn winds would blow around it mournfully, and the grey rain would beat upon it and the white mists would come in from the sea to enfold it, and the moonlight would fall over it and light up the old paths where the schoolmaster and his bride had walked. There on that old harbor shore the charm of story would linger, the wind would still whistle alluringly over the silver sand dunes, the waves would still call from the red rock coves. But we will be gone, said Anne through her tears. She went out, closing and locking the door behind her. Gilbert was waiting for her with a smile. The lighthouse star was gleaming northward. The little garden, where only marigolds still bloomed, was already hooding itself in shadows. Anne knelt down and kissed the worn old step which she had crossed as a bride. 
Goodbye, dear little house of dreams, she said.